monetary arrangements are put forward and agreed um, uh, in the aftermath of uh, the referendum on independence. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next side of business is a statement by John Swinney on Ferguson's shipyard. Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Uh, President officer, I'd like to make a statement on the announcement last Friday, the 15th of August, of the appointment of administrators to Ferguson shipbuilders. Some 70 workers were directly affected by immediate redundancy announcements. Uh, our thoughts are with those individuals, with their families, as they go through this period of significant uncertainty. The Scottish Government's immediate response to the news was to ensure that we were doing all that we could to support the workers who have been affected by this announcement. Um, following the announcement on Friday, we immediately offered individual, tailored support to each of these employees through our Partnership Action for Continuing Employment initiative, and we will work with KPMG as administrator and with the trade unions to ensure that we deliver the best, most practical and personal support that we can. We have also established a task force with the aim of retaining a functioning shipyard and employing as many of the Ferguson staff as is possible. I chaired the first meeting of the task force yesterday. In attendance were the Transport Minister, representatives from across Inverclyde Council, including the Leader of the Council and its Chief Executive, the Administrators, KPMG, PACE, the Department of Work and Pensions, Scottish Enterprise, the Scottish Government, the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions, local shop stewards from the, uh, the Ferguson Shipyard and local members of the Scottish Parliament. We discussed the immediate and practical assistance that could be made available for those facing redundancy, as well as the potential for maximising the opportunities for long-term employment in shipbuilding on the Lower Clyde. However, the task force has unanimously agreed that there will be a concerted and coherent effort to do everything in our collective and combined powers to secure a new owner for the yard. We are determined to see shipbuilding continue on the Lower Clyde. We will continue to work together to ensure that we see the best possible outcome for Port Glasgow. The next meeting of the task force will be on Monday coming and we will continue to meet for as long as it takes to achieve the aims of the task force. This chamber is well aware of the long and proud heritage of shipbuilding on the River Clyde. For Ferguson specifically, this dates back some 103 years when four brothers established the yard. At one point, it employed up to 200 people. More recently, following a difficult period in the early 2000s, we have witnessed the yard look to the future with the cutting-edge delivery of the world's first seagoing roll-on, roll-off diesel-electric hybrid ferries. Since 2007, anything Ferguson's have had the capability and the capacity to bid for, they have been successful in winning. Specifically, we awarded to Ferguson's the contract for two hybrid ferries in October 2011 procured by Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, CMAL, and funded by Transport Scotland. These contracts have provided over £20 million worth of work for Ferguson's, accounting for a substantial part of the yard's recent work. The Scottish Government, through the vessel owners at Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, worked very closely with the owners and the management of Ferguson to ensure the delivery of these vessels. At the time of that award, it was understood that this work would enable the company to remain competitive and it was hoped would give it a unique capability and foundation for further orders. This has not proven to be the case. Since, 2000 and, since January 2014, Ferguson's have been working with CMAL, Transport Scotland and Scottish Enterprise to review their financial position. With the support of CMAL, their final payment on the second hybrid ferry to Ferguson's was split into staged payments to help ease cash flow pressures. Scottish Enterprise at that stage provided grant support for a financial health check to help establish the business's financial position and short-term funding requirements. This was followed up in February 2014 with financial readiness support to strategically review the business and prepare it for investment, again provided by Scottish Enterprise. In March 2014, further grant support was delivered to provide information that would help Ferguson's consider the medium-term needs of the business, including new investment or ownership to reshape the business. There continues to be work at Ferguson's, part funded by £2 million from the Scottish Government and the European Fisheries Fund, which needs to be finished. 
This work will be important to any new owner in the early days of any takeover, and it's obviously important to the customer to take delivery of a vessel that they have already invested a great amount in completing. We will do whatever we can within the rules to pay grant claims to the vessel owner very quickly indeed once work recommences. And I firmly believe that there is a viable future for shipbuilding on the Lower Clyde. Our aspiration for future ferry orders remains and I have allocated significant capital funds to Transport Scotland to deliver this. The Scottish Ferries Plan sets out a series of vessel procurements over the next decade. 12, Calmac vessel, 12 current Calmac vessels are to be replaced at an estimated cost of up to £250 million. Half of these are vessels of a size similar to the two hybrid ferries recently built by Ferguson's. Calmac, Seamal and Transport Scotland are currently completing long-term plans for this procurement programme. There will certainly be construction work for a new owner of Ferguson to compete for, as well as regular repair and maintenance work from CalMac. The Scottish Government is investing, through CalMac and CMAL, significant sums into the design, construction and maintenance of vessels. There is sufficient work to sustain Ferguson's under a new owner, with the vision and the commitment to invest in the shipyard and its workforce. We would work closely with any new owner to support them in building a sustainable business recognising that this cannot happen overnight. But I must return to the most important aspect of recent events. There are 70 livelihoods at direct stake. In Port Glasgow, we have a highly skilled workforce. It is essential that these skills are put to productive use, and that commitment must be delivered with real urgency. The Administrator has made it clear that Friday's announcement has generated significant interest in the assets and the capabilities of Ferguson's. There is a challenge for all of us to work together to secure the long-term future of the shipyard. Our goal continues to be to secure the long-term future of Scotland's vital shipbuilding industry. The Government will do all that it can to work with others to secure the future of shipbuilding on the Lower Clyde. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We now move to questions on the issues. I intend to allow around 20 minutes. Anybody who wishes to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary should press the request speak button now. And I call Ian Gray. Yeah, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and early sight of it. The descent into administration of Ferguson's, our last commercial shipyard, uh, is a blow to an iconic industry uh, and one to which we must respond with every resource <coughs> at our disposal. Uh, the hardest blow is, of course, to the workforce and their families, and I very much associate these benches with the Cabinet Secretary's assurances that our thoughts are with them first and foremost. Though this yard is over a century old, these are not old-fashioned jobs. The work is highly skilled, and the product of this yard technically advanced, innovative and cutting-edge. As we heard, the last two vessels produced by Ferguson's were groundbreaking, award-winning hybrid ferries. I think we can all agree that these should be the jobs of the future, not the past, and we must ensure that it is so. The Cabinet Secretary was very clear. We have a yard, a skilled, proven workforce, a customer in Seamal, 12 vessels to be built, £250 million to be invested. We surely must find a way to ensure that that investment supports jobs here rather than somewhere else. So what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give any potential new owners that orders for Ferguson's will be forthcoming and quickly? Cabinet Secretary. Can I uh, welcome the, um, the substance of Ian Gray's remarks and uh, agree entirely that the jobs at Ferguson's represent jobs of the future, particularly given the innovation that has been taken forward by Ferguson's in recent years in taking forward the hybrid vessels, which of course uh, are vessels that contribute significantly, um, not only in terms of new technology, but also in addressing uh, some of the issues about a uh, carbon reduction that all administrations around the world will have to address. And, Ferguson's are in a leading position in terms of being able to influence that, uh, uh, that whole consideration by a variety of different countries. 
In relation to the prospects of future orders, I set out in my statement the extent of the investment in the ferry fleet that will be taken forward in uh, the next few years um, at an estimated cost of up to £250 million across 12 uh, Carmack vessels. Around about half of those vessels are of a size that would, be, uh, that would equate to the hybrid ferries that have just been completed by Ferguson's. And uh, as I indicated in my statement, uh, Ferguson's have um, a, st a strong track record of being successful in securing the orders for which they are equipped to bid, uh, given the size and the focus of the yard. Uh, so I can assure Parliament that uh, the Government is putting in place the resources to ensure there is an ongoing and sustained investment programme in the CalMac fleet. Um, that the Government will commit itself to making those um, orders available at the appropriate uh, times in relation to the renewal of the fleet, um, given the commitments that the Government has to operate lifeline ferry services and to ensure that those um, uh, lifeline ferry services are undertaken uh, by vessels of the appropriate quality and strength to undertake the task. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement and also for convening the task force, which I was very pleased to attend the meeting of yesterday in Greenock. And can I echo the deep concerns shared by everyone about the events which have engulfed Ferguson's and, of course, the consequences for the workforce. In the statement, Presiding Officer, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to see shipbuilding continue on the Lower Clyde. Now, in the interest of finding a new purchaser, which I think everyone agrees is the best way forward, has the Scottish Government had any communication with the United Kingdom Government to see if it can help? And has it had any communication with Shipbuilders UK simply to ensure that every possible purchase possibility is being investigated? Cabinet Secretary. The, in relation to discussion with the UK Government, I, I spoke this morning with the Secretary of State for Scotland about the issues and, of course, if there is anything... Uh, he made clear to me if there's anything the United Kingdom government could do, um, they would, would do so. But uh, um, he um, uh, certainly relayed to me um, a view that uh, all steps that uh, could be taken were being taken at this stage. Um, in relation to the um, looking for new investors, uh, the, the government will talk to anybody who's a serious bidder in the process. Um, and uh, obviously the primary responsibility for that dialogue lies with the administrators given their statutory functions in this respect. Uh, I would, however, take the opportunity of Ms Goldie's question to make the point that we do believe that the way forward is with new ownership and new investment, and that is a, a, it is the supremely urgent priority of the next few days to secure that, because without securing that investment in the next few days, there is obviously the danger that perhaps the critical, what I consider to be the critical asset of Ferguson's, the workforce, will start to dissipate as individuals, quite understandably, uh, try to secure alternative opportunities uh, to, um, to support their, uh, their families. Um, but uh, I can assure the Chamber that um, the identification of new ownership is the absolute and immediate priority of the Government, and I discussed those issues again, uh, once again this morning with the Administrator in that respect. Stuart McMillan, followed by Duncan McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the statement, the speed of the action, and also the collegiate approach taken thus far with the establishment of the task force. Uh, but I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary what support the Scottish Government can provide to prospective buyers to diversify the yard, uh, as this doesn't appear to have been fully capitalised upon up until now. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the, I think, as I've indicated in my statement, um, the government, through the work of Transport Scotland, CMAL and Scottish Enterprise, have been heavily involved in supporting the development of the, uh, the yard at Ferguson's. Uh, the hybrid ferry contract is in itself a significant example of diversification of the deployment of an entirely new technology and its application in a challenging environment. And having been on the MV Loch and Var just the other week there, I can testify that it is a beautiful piece of work by Ferguson's, uh, an absolutely fantastic piece of work. So uh, th 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 there, is exam there is evidence of diversification already. And I think what the hybrid ferry contract represents 
is an opportunity to market an innovation from Scotland to uh, jurisdictions around the world. And I think that's a very significant and attractive opportunity for any new buyer uh, to invest in the plant as a consequence. Duncan McNeill, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, <coughs> President Officer, and I kind of thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and indeed support much of the sentiment in that statement. Obviously, as the, the, the constituency MSP for the area and, and being with that workforce, we've, we turn to harder questions that they wish to ask or wish me to ask. And, and they're asking the question about why promises of further CalMAC orders were were not delivered and why the yard was allowed to close and could the closure have been prevented. And now, with the statement today, we, we have confirmed that the Scottish Government have been working with the employers on the per perilous uh, financial situation for eight months. And the workforce, as you know, are very angry about kept, being kept in the dark about those situations. Will you give an assurance today that all talks with potential employers will lead to the continuation of manufacturing and shipbuilding at that yard, will not be used for any other purpose, and give a, a guarantee that there will be new openness and, and, and with involvement from the trade unions and the workforce with any future potential owners. What I could say to Mr. There's three points I'd like to make to Mr. McNeill, and I understand obviously the, uh, the, 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 the raw sensitivity of this issue in the Port, Port Glasgow community and uh, I addressed that on my visit to the yard yesterday and in my discussions with the workforce and subsequently with the shop stewards and I'm sure this point was also discussed when the First Minister met the shop stewards earlier on today into the bargain. The government and its agencies have been involved in trying to address what I described at the uh, task force yesterday as the precarious financial position of Ferguson's for some time. That is what the government does all the time. We do it for companies that um, we uh, invariably do not disclose. We do not disclose to Parliament or to anybody that we're having those discussions because to disclose those discussions would be to destabilise many of the companies that we're trying to address and to try to support. So it is, you know, it's not something I'm going to apologise to Parliament for. I think Parliament would be horrified if the government was not involved in private discussions with companies to try to remedy their precarious financial situation. That is what government, or this government certainly is here to do. How employers then deal with that with their employees is a different matter and that's where I want to address a second point that Mr McNeill um, has raised. Um, I think in all my experience of these situations where we are involved in discussions with companies about their precarious financial position. The situation is much improved when the workforce are taken into the loop, because that is where many of the good solutions come from. And I can think of numerous examples that have never hit the headlines, where jobs have been saved, hundreds of jobs saved, which has never been in a newspaper in the country, because of the private discussions involving trade unions, the workforce, management and the government to resolve these issues. And I think it would be better if there was that type of discussion going on. And that's frankly what Mr Mather, in, his, in the review that he undertook yesterday, the, the key point emerging out of those, uh, that review was that workforce and um, management discussions are a tremendous asset in resolving challenges within companies. And the final point is that uh, on the issue of um, uh, the, the future role for the Ferguson shipyard, I, I was crystal clear yesterday, I'm crystal clear today, my priority is to secure a future for Ferguson's as a shipbuilding concern in the years to come. That is the focus of our discussions. It's, um, it, we don't have control over that issue because the administrator is now in control of the site, but the government's in intervention and the government's approach will be to secure the future for Ferguson's as a, uh, as a shipbuilding concern in the years to come. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Willie Rennie. I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement. As someone who represents an island community, there have been discussions, I understand, since at least November 2012 on the designs to replace uh, ferries on the Brodick to Ardrossan uh, route over the next few years. Can uh, the Cabinet Secretary tell us when these new orders are actually going to be placed? Because clearly any new buyer wants to know that there's not only the likelihood of new orders, but when new orders uh, can be placed. Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, what I can say to Mr Gibson is that there is a, a, an ongoing programme in the ferries plan which sets out the routes that will require replacement uh, vessels. Um, those uh, priorities will be worked through as they are set out in the ferries plan. We, of course, um, are currently are shortly to, uh, to uh, take delivery of the, um, uh, the Loch Seaforth for the stornoway Ullapool route. Um, and there will be further contracts as a, uh, that follow on in the wake of uh, the Loch Seaforth. Um, th these are all set out in the ferries plan, and the government will provide the support that is envisaged in the ferry plan to ensure that can be realised. Oliver Rennie, followed by Maureen Mott. I'd like to thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. Earlier this year, the Deputy First Minister said, we would have preferred to see a private company buy Prestwick Airport. But the strategic and economic importance of Prestwick Airport is such that we were not prepared to see it close. If the alternative is closure, will the government buy Ferguson's? Uh, I, well, the situation that we find ourselves in now is that um, Ferguson's is, uh, is in administration and it is now uh, the responsibility of the administrator to take forward um, that, uh, uh, that responsibility. Um, I think the best thing I can say in response to Mr Rennie's question is the government, I don't think at this stage, is prepared to rule anything out. Um, we want to see shipbuilding continuing at the Clyde um, and at Ferguson's Yard. Um, we will do all that we can to try to secure new ownership, um, but we will keep an open mind on all options that are available to the government at this time. Maureen Watt, followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, making sure that the, the, the priority is to secure a new owner for the shipyard? Because, as he knows, we've had several kinds of conversations about how there can be diversification at the yard. But can he confirm that Dale's engineering of Peterhead have taken over some of the apprentices so that they can complete their apprenticeship? I'm afraid that's a level of detail I don't have in front of me, but I do know that the, there are six apprentices at, um, at uh, Ferguson's. Uh, there was discussion of the shop stewards were leaving my discussion with them yesterday to go with the, um, the, uh, the, the apprentices to support them in trying to complete, uh, make arrangements to complete their, uh, their apprenticeships. Um, I haven't had an update on the, des on the final destinations that have been arrived at, but uh, all efforts have been taken forward by the shop stewards, by uh, PACE, uh, to ensure that the apprentices were in a position to be able to complete uh, their apprenticeships. Jenny Mara, followed by Joe McAlpine. The Cabinet Secretary has made clear that ferry procurement is a potential source of orders for Ferguson's. Will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to examine whether that procurement could at least be brought forward to provide that opportunity sooner for Ferguson's Yard? Cabinet Secretary. Um, we certainly will um, explore how we can ensure there is um, a, credible and, um, a credible flow of work that can be accessed by, uh, by Ferguson's uh, under the process of competitive tender, and uh, we will be uh, taking all steps, as we have done over recent years with the two vessels that have been uh, secured by Ferguson's, to ensure that every opportunity is there uh, for the yard to complete contracts of this nature. Joe McAlpine, followed by Michael McMahon. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what support will be given to those workers in Ferguson's uh, who are facing redundancy but were approaching retirement? Cabinet Secretary. The, the purpose of the intervention by uh, PACE, uh, working collaboratively with the Department of Work and Pensions, is to ensure that every individual, at whatever stage in their, uh, their working life, is able to obtain the necessary support and advice to equip them for dealing with those, uh, those challenges. Um, so, the, uh, in response to Maureen Watt, I indicated that specific support was made available to um, the apprentices. Um, in relation to the question that Joe McAlpine has asked me, then, of course, for uh, workers who are, uh, are near retirement, the advice will be tailored to meet their circumstances and to assist them in a way that meets their requirements and their priorities. Finally, Michael McMahon. Thank you, President Officer. And can I bring the Chamber to my, the attention of my register of interest? I am a member of the GMB Union. In the wake of last, week, uh, last week's announcement, Jim Mohan, the GMB Scotland Senior Organiser and Chairman of the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions, said that the First Minister can, we believe, 
directly intervene in tender for commercial work within Europe to allow this yard to remain open. All governments have the right to make bold decisions to save an industry. He also said that a failure to inter intervene would be an utter betrayal. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we can always rely on Michael McMahon to go with the flow of uh, cross-party working on all these questions. I think I've been pretty clear to... Uh, I have been pretty clear to Parliament today that the Government is going to do everything it possibly can do to secure the future of the Ferguson shipyard as an ongoing shipyard concern, that we will do everything we possibly can do to secure a future for the workforce. And that is exactly what I am concentrating on, and I am not concentrating on political point scoring like Mr McMahon. Thank you. That ends the statement on Ferguson's. We now move to the next ministerial statement, which is the future of the SA. NHS. I'll give a few moments. And I call Nally Neil, um, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. Hey, Presiding Officer, Malcolm Chisholm last week asked for a statement on the consequences for the National Health Service of both a yes and a no vote in next month's referendum. And as I said last week, I'm happy to oblige. In short, the people of Scotland have a choice between two futures, one where the vast wealth of this nation can be marshalled to help create a fairer society, or one where the budgets available for Scotland's public services are consigned to the whim of Westminster. Nye Bevan's founding principles for the National Health Service were an institution owned by the people, giving access to the highest attainable standard of health services, free at the point of delivery, based on clinical need and not ability to pay. I believe these principles must be protected, and a yes vote gives this nation a chance to do just that by framing a constitution that reflects the values and aspirations of our nation. As the First Minister set out last week, one proposal that we will take to the Independence Constitutional Convention will be to enshrine the National Health Service as an institution in that constitution. That would ensure that in contrast to what is happening south of the border, our health service could never be privatised against the wishes of the people. I note that all in this chamber say they do not favour privatisation. So I trust they will join with us in the Constitutional Convention after a yes vote in making the case for constitutional protection for the National Health Service. Scotland is a wealthy nation. We do not need to limit our ambitions to the perimeter parameters of Barnet consequentials. With the full powers of independence, the Scottish Government could do yet more to strengthen our economy, create more jobs, and to make the kind of transformational investment that would help thousands of people back into work. More people in work isn't just good for the economy, it's essential for improving the nation's health. A no vote is a very different and disturbing prospect for our National Health Service and our wider public services. Under the current arrangements, Every £10 cut from health spending in England through austerity, privatisation and patient charges will consequently reduce Scotland's budget by around a pound. Privatisation leading to further patient charges, enabled by the Health and Social Care Act in England, means that services that were previously free will have to be paid for by patients. This will see the replacement of public funding with private money and have a consequential impact on Scotland's budget. Be in no doubt, reduced free services in England, along with the extended charging for health services, are exactly what is happening and will continue to happen in England. As Unite the Union has already warned, the public will increasingly have to pay for aspects of their care that used to be free at the time of treatment. This is a concern that the Labour Party in England share. As their publication The Choice stated, the prospect is of more NHS services being charged for and fewer services being provided free at the point of need. It's also the view of the Labour Party in Wales, where my opposite number, the Labour Health Minister Mark Drakeford, has said that the fundamental issue is the impact on public services in Wales of the cuts being made by the administration in Westminster and passed down to Wales. 
That is what the fundamental problem is here. We have a Westminster government that believes in shrinking the state, which believes in doing less through the public realm and passes less money down to us in order to be able to do it. Labour's English health spokesman, Andy Burnham, has given the same signal warning. Five more years of the same would push the National Health Service off the cliff edge where it now finds itself. And he also said that the coalition sees no limits on the extent of privatisation in the National Health Service. Yet here in Scotland, the Labour Party would have us believe that their colleagues in England and Wales are wrong, there would be no impact from the austerity, privatisation and charging agenda of the current Westminster government. That wasn't always the case, of course. In 2009, the warning was from Labour in Scotland that the Tories were, and I quote, relishing the chance to swing the acts that the public services millions rely on. Cuts driven by ideology. That warning came from one Alistair Darling. <laughs> Strangely, Alistair Darling was defending Osborne's budgets on the radio this morning and claimed that the National Health Service spending in England has been increasing for the last Order. four years under Order. the present government. Yet Andy Burnham warned in 2012 that the Conservatives have cut the National Health Service budget for two years running and he owes it, the Minister, to patients and NHS, NHS staff to be honest about that. In the 2010 election, Scottish Labour's election campaign broadcast upon which Mr Darling and all Labour MPs were elected, said the Tories starved our schools and hospitals of funding and there's a real risk that we do the same again. Even after the Conservatives took office, Labour warned again what's going to happen when David Cameron's cuts start to hit. Scotland is worried and the right to be worried, so said Ian Gray. <laughs> Labour MP Michael Meacher has gone further still this year on the future of the health service in England. We know the latest steps being proposed to make the NHS into a full-blown private health Order. service. The truth has been let out of the bag that the Tories and their big corporate friends had in fact intended Order. all along... Order! Let us hear the Cabinet Secretary. ...had in fact intended all along that it would become a fully paid-up service, only they didn't dare say so before now. Perhaps in no campaign would have us believe that despite the warnings of the Labour Party in England, Labour in Wales, the Jarrow Marchers and myriad warnings from trade unions that the Tories are actually privatising the health service in order to increase public spending. <laughs> as, as Mark Drafer outlined, we already know that the Tories' plans for spending are yet deeper cuts. Ed Balls has pledged to keep Labour within the Tory spending plans and George Osborne has pledged to force through another £25 billion worth of cuts. Since 2010, when the Coalition came to office, we have already had a 7.2% cut in real terms to our resource budget, plus a 26% cut in our capital budget. Despite these cuts, the SNP government has managed to protect the frontline resource NHS budget in Scotland, and since 2010, we have kept it increasing in each year above real terms. I don't think anyone in this chamber can think it a real realistic prospect that if further deep cuts through austerity are forced in Scotland by Westminster, that services will be left unscathed. The solution proposed by the No campaign is that taxes should be hiked in Scotland to offset these to planned Tory cuts. That is unacceptable and a double whammy for Scotland. That is why a no vote would be putting our health service at serious risk. Reduced budgets as a consequence of privatisation, patient charges, fragmented pay arrangements for health staff, with further pay restrictions and austerity as a matter of ideology south of the border would be the consequence of a no vote. That is why we in this side of the chamber choose the path where the power and wealth of Scotland is put in the hands of the people of Scotland. We choose a future 
where Nye Bevan's founding principles for the health service are not simple articles of aspiration, but part of our constitution. We choose to ensure that those who come after, after us can have the guarantee of a health service free at the point of need, just as we have benefited throughout our and our families' lives. We are inviting the people of Scotland to choose that path with us. The first step is simple. Vote yes for independence on the 18th of September. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we move to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary were to press the request speak button now. And I call Neil Findlay. Even for the Cabinet Secretary, I think he surpassed himself there. Uh, President Officer at the <laughs> SNP conference. Order! <laughs> Order! <laughs> President Officer at the SNP conference in 2014, Nicola Sturgeon said, I can stand here proudly and say this. For as long as we are in government, there will be no privatisation of the NHS in Scotland. And yet yesterday and today, that position has been contradicted by the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary. The SNP manifesto in 2011 said, and I quote, the Scottish Parliament has responsibility for the health service, and that means we can protect NHS budgets. The White Paper said, without devolution, the NHS would have been repeatedly reorganised and exposed to private competition. Now, President Officer, I'm not allowed to call anyone in this chamber a liar, but was Nicola Sturgeon not telling the truth at her conference? Did the SNP not tell the truth in their manifesto? Or is the Cabinet Secretary not well telling the truth now? Now, I'm not allowed to call the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister liars, but will they condemn a campaign? Will they condemn a campaign that claims private health care is cheaper and more efficient than public health care? I'm not allowed to call the Cabinet Secretary and First Minister liars. Your time's up, accept... Mr Findlay. But... Do you have a question? But do they accept that the greatest threat to the NHS in Scotland is the £6 billion of cuts in public spending that would occur under their plans to break up the country? <laughs> and won't the Cabinet Secretary focus on his day job and sort out waiting lists, huge problems in A&E, staffing and bed cuts, a social care crisis and a lack of GPs instead of supporting the most scandalous deceit of this referendum campaign today. Cabinet Secretary. Pre pres presiding officer, in the spirit of Mr Finlay's remarks, can I thank him for the compliment at the start of his uh, question? Uh, can I also say to him, I don't think Mr Finlay basically understands what devolution means. Yeah. Let me remind him of what Enoch Powell said many years ago. Devolu Dev power devolved is power retained. Yeah. What we have got to look at is not just today and tomorrow, it's five and ten years' time. With a constitution that embeds and enshrines the basic principles of the National Health Service, Scotland will never have a privatised health service, ever. Our powers in a devolved parliament, our powers in a devolved parliament are not enshrined and they can be overruled at any time by any future Westminster government. And as far as the money is concerned, I'll tell you the biggest problem Order, I have Mr. Finlay. financially is that we have been left with a legacy by the previous Labour administration of a bill for £220 million every year for your PFI. And Order. That's the biggest spending on the private sector initiated by Labour a rip-off for the health service and you've landed us with it for 30 years. Jackson Carlaw, followed by Ailey McLeod. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement, although I'm bound to say I can't recall a statement that relied so much on cut-and-paste quotations from third parties 
not all of which amounted to nothing more than speculation, rumour and unsubstantiated allegation. <laughs> now, the Cabinet Secretary relied particularly in his statement Order, on the consequences you, of the Health and Social Care Act in England. Here is the government's statement when that act was passed. It's expected that it will produce 4.5 billion of savings in the lifetime of this parliament, with every penny being reinvested in patient care. In consequence of that, the government themselves have published figures which show that there have been consequentials in 2011 of 280 million, 2012 of 249 million, 2013 of 293 million, 2014 of 284 million, and 2015 anticipated of 202 million. An increase, and the clue is in the word increase, of 1.3 billion coming to the Scottish Government to spend on health. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore identify today any statement from the Treasury or the Department of Health which at any time has identified a reduction in health spending, which has been ring-fenced as it has been throughout the very worst recession that we have known. And if he cannot do that, does he not realise how shamefully this last-minute attempt to, to scare un vulnerable voters into voting yes really is? In the, spirit, in the spirit of this chamber, I have offered to work constructively with the Scottish Government, as have others, to set aside the course of the health service in England, to ensure that we in Scotland do work to preserve a public sector health service free at the point and need of delivery. Is the Cabinet Secretary now spurning that offer which he himself embraced readily and enthusiastically at every other stage in the lifetime of this Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Can I first of all say that Mr Carlo is saying nowhere is there no increase. Can I tell him the nurses and other agenda for change workers in the National Health Service will refuse the pay increase recommended by their pay review body, not just for this year, but for next year by his government. They don't have an increase this year or next year. We implemented the recommendations and we implemented them for a year with a view to reviewing them again in a year's time as normal. But nurses down south have been treated with contempt by the health secretary down there. So I don't think we'll take any lessons about what is promised and what is said by a Tory government in London. No nurse in England would believe anything the Tories said about the health service. And as far as the money is concerned, let me just say, first of all, that the reason why we are spending so much additional money in the health service is because the SNP government has ring-fenced the money for health, while your government has cut our resource budget by 7.5% and our capital budget by 26%. And over the last five years, Scotland, Scotland's £8 billion advantage has been taken down to London to subsidise the Treasury down there. Had we had access to our own £8 billion over those years, the increase in spending in public services would have been a lot higher, presiding officer. As members would expect, I have a large number of uh, members who wish to ask a question. Can I urge uh, brief questions and brief answers? Ailey McLeod, full by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Given that George Osborne has promised £25 billion of spending cuts after the 2015 general election, and the Labour Party have signed up to Osborne's spending plans, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what the real terms impact to the Scottish resource budget will be if Scotland were to remain within the Union? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, depending on where the Westminster Act on public spending falls by 2018 19, if the further threatened cuts are implemented, then since the Coalition came to office, Scotland's budget will be cut in real terms by between four and five billion pounds. That's cuts of between 14.6% and 18.3%. The worst case scenario is the frontline Scottish resource budget being cut in real terms from 27.3 billion in 2010-11 to 22.3 billion in 2018-19. To put it in, te the, in terms of no campaign might understand that's more than the entire schools budget for Scotland. Rhoda Grant, followed by Joe McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Would it be fair to say that this new scare story seeks to divert attention from the Scottish Government's privatisation of the NHS yep. here in Scotland? Order. Question. 
Last year, there was a huge 23% increase in spending on private health care here within the NHS in Scotland. Does he agree with Audit Scotland that it shows a strain in the system? Will he now take responsibility and join Labour and have a comprehensive review of the NHS? Presiding, uh, presiding officer, as I've already said, the biggest expenditure to the private sector in Scotland is the £220 million pounds in PFI charges. But let me also say, if you look at our spend in the private sector in Scotland as a percentage of our total budget, in five out of the six years since we came to power, for which final figures are available, we have spent less than the Labour administration before us as a percentage of the total budget. So you have, and let me also remind the member, because she maybe has a short memory, that it wasn't this government that tried to privatise Stracathro. I think it was her government that tried to privatise services at Stracathro, and it took Nicola Sturgeon to reverse that privatisation and keep it in the public sector. Joe McAlpine, followed by Wally Rennie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Just across the border from my south of Scotland constituency, the hospitals in Cumbria are struggling to deal with the market system imposed on them. Several are under special measures and the Trust is £27 million in debt. This has been further exacerbated by a commercial decision to transfer all hip and knee operations to Hexham, further depriving Cumbria of £2.7 million, which is likely to be recouped through Can further cuts to Can we just a question that's care. relevant to the Cabinet Can Secretary? The, I'm coming to that. How can the Health Secretary guarantee that my constituents can always rely on a public NHS and not the profit-led system being imposed on their neighbours in England? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, there are two ways. First of all, when we're independent, we get the government we elect. I don't think any Scottish government will ever, ever dare to try to privatise the health service in Scotland. We saw the price the Labour Party paid in 2007 when they tried a bit of privatisation in Stracathro and indeed in Hart Hill in my own constituency. But the way to absolutely guarantee it is to write the founding principles of the National Health Service into an independent Scotland's constitution and build it into the ethos of this parliament so that nobody, by accident or by design, can privatise our health service. Well, Rennie, followed by Colin Keir. I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. The NHS has received more money, not less, under every single UK government for decades. The share of the UK national income spent on the NHS has doubled in the last 50 years. It is his independence plans that will cut £6 billion from our public services and threaten our NHS. Isn't the Minister just a little bit ashamed that he's misusing our NHS to shore up his campaign? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, what I would be ashamed about would be if my party was shoring up the Tories and the privatisation agenda that Mr. Rennie. Order. I find it's inconceivable that the Liberal Party in Scotland supports privatisation of the grassroots. It's inconceivable they support the benefit welfare reforms that are doing so much damage to disabled people. I think if anybody should be holding their head in shame as Mr Rennie. Colin Keir, followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you. This morning on Radio Scotland, Alistair Darling said, look, it's no secret that the Tories have long had their sights on public spending. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this highlights the hypocrisy of the No campaign who claim public spending is safe at Westminster? Secretary. Presiding officer, of course, the public spending cuts were started by Alistair Darling when he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So I can understand why he's defending Tory cuts, uh, although in that interview he seemed to be facing at least two ways. In fact, after the interview, I began to think he had more faces than Big Ben. <laughs> Malcolm Tissom, followed by Christine Graham. Uh, forced to change his narrative every time he uh, opens his mouth. Will the Cabinet Secretary now confirm that yes, campaigners are being mendacious when they say all over Scotland that the Scottish NHS would be privatised following an NHS vote and ill-informed 
when they say that privatised services cost less public money, contrary to the view of NHS campaigners in England. Isn't the real threat to the Scottish NHS the possibility of a yes vote and the increased austerity that would follow according to all independent economists? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the last part is just totally factually incorrect. But let me say to Mr Chisholm, if you look at the impact of charges and privatisation, is about imposing charges on services that previously were free of charge. If a service is paid through charges instead of taxation, which is the direction of travel down south, then the amount of revenue through time spent on the National Health Service will decline because the revenue will come from the charges. If the revenue declines, if we stay under the Barnett formula, through time, our revenue, our budget will decline as well. And let me quote, let me quote from a survey undertaken on the 1st of July 2014. Uh, and this was a survey of the leading health and social care leaders in England, presiding officer. They were asked the question, and this is done by the Nuffield Trust, a highly respected organisation. They asked the question, how likely do you think it is that comprehensive health care, excluding charges that are already applying, will still be provided free at the point of use in England in 10 years' time? Presiding officer, 47% answered unlikely or very unlikely. They don't believe that the charges are not coming in England. They believe they are coming, and they are the leading professionals in the health and social care system in England. Christine, they are politically independent. I would believe them before I believe Malcolm Chisholm. Christine Graham, followed by Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of scare stories put about by the No campaign that the excellent... <laughs> That the Order, excellent cross-border arrangements for health care between Scotland and England, particularly in my constituency, will cease after independence. How does he respond to that accusation? Pre Presiding officer, uh, can I say that, and this is obviously very serious, to make it absolutely clear to people that irrespective of the result of the referendum, the cross-border arrangements between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, and indeed the cross-border arrangements between ourselves and the rest of the United Kingdom and the European Union, which is covered by a cross-border directive, will all continue. And indeed, beyond that, we quite regularly send patients as far away as the United States, where they require a very specialist treatment. That will continue as well. And it's two-way traffic, presiding officer. In a typical year, as well as us sending patients out with Scotland to get specialist treatment, there are about 7,500 people come to Scotland for very specialist treatment they can't get anywhere else. I don't think any government representing those people will do anything to endanger the cross-border arrangements. Ken McIntosh, followed by Murray Moore. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And leaving aside the uh, misstatements and inaccuracies of his so-called parliamentary statement, does the Cabinet Secretary recognise the uh, irony that of his remarks today when under his plans for independence, Scotland will be no longer part of the NHS as founded by Nye Bevan? <laughs> we will no, be no longer part of the UK NHS. And for the first time since 1948, Scots will no longer be part of the NHS across the whole of the UK. The member. Following his remarks to uh, my parliamentary colleague, can the, First Minister, can the Cabinet Secretary address the concerns of a constituent who believes he might have to use an E111 card to access services across the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding, presiding officer, obviously the member was up all night thinking of that one. <laughs> uh, can I just say to the member, we do not have a UK national health service because the divergence between what's happening north of the border and what has happened south of the border renders that impossible. South of the border, they're privatising. North of the border, we are keeping the health service free at the point of use and in public hands. And, presiding officer, Mr. Henry, we, please we have stop free it. personal care, they don't. 
We have free prescriptions. They charge £9 per prescription. And despite what Andy Burnham suggested, there is no way we would allow a publicly owned national health service in Scotland in any way to be absorbed into a partially and about to be extensively privatised health service south of the border. Maureen Watt, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary referred to the document, The Choice, in which the Labour Party has recently raised the prospect of patient charges in England and of, I quote, fewer services being provided free at the point of need in England. Are the Labour Party in England wrong and how would this impact on the budget available for these services in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Presiding Officer, I don't think the Labour Party in England is wrong in terms of their analysis, nor is Mark Drakeford. As I speak, there is something of the order of £5.8 billion of invites to tender to the private sector currently issued in England to invite private sector companies, large companies, profit-making companies to come in and take over the work of NHS doctors, nurses and other staff. So there is no doubt at all the facts speak for themselves. The health service is being rapidly and extensively privatised south of the border. Thank you. I'm going to call Alison Johnson, followed by Margaret McCulloch, because I did have an indication Mr McNeill wanted a question, but he's not here. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Is the Cabinet Secretary concerned about the profound threat, as Unison describe it, of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership on public services, including health, and will the government join the growing number of organisations and individuals who oppose this proposed trade deal? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, we don't oppose the trade deal in principle, but we absolutely oppose any inclusion of free public services like the National Health Service being included in such a deal. And my colleague John Swinney and myself have both made that absolutely clear publicly. And indeed, we have written to both the UK Government and the European Union to make it absolutely clear that in the TTIP negotiations, the health service must be excluded, so there must be no part of that deal which forces us in any way to privatise the health service in Scotland or indeed in any other country where the health service is in public ownership. And finally, Margaret McCullough. Thank you, President Officer. According to the British Medical Journal, 60% of Scotland's doctors are planning to vote no. Why does the Cabinet Minister think that is the case? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, in that survey, 14% replied. So I've been trying to talk to the other 86%. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I, I can assure the member, I am absolutely convinced the vast bulk of the 158,000 people working in the National Health Service in Scotland will be voting yes, because they see that only a yes vote will keep the health service in public hands in Scotland. <laughs> Thank you. That ends questions to the Cabinet Secretary on the future of the NHS in Scotland. The next item of business is Stage 3 proceedings on the Revenue Scotland the Taxpayers Bill. Dealing with amendments, members should have the bills amended at Stage 2. That is SP Bill 43A, the Marshall List. That is SP Bill 43A, ML. The groupings, that is SP Bill 43A, G. I'll let do that. For further information, the division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon, should there be one. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds and thereafter I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments and we will get started. And I call Group 1 um, and call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group to Amendment 2, Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. 
President Officer, I move Amendment 1 and will speak to it together with Amendment 2. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee recommended in its Stage 1 report on the Bill that where Scottish Ministers give guidance to Revenue Scotland under Section 8 of the Bill, a copy of that guidance should be laid before Parliament as well as published. These amendments give effect to that recommendation. Uh, I move Amendment 1. Thank you. Um, so the question is uh, that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary moved. moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Now call Group 2. And call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with Amendments 4 to 6 and 89 to 92. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 3 and speak to other amendments in the group, please. President Officer, I move Amendment 3 and will speak to it and other amendments in this group. These amendments relate to the Scottish Tax Tribunals, which are established by Part 4 of the Bill. The amendments are entirely technical in nature. Amendments 3, 4 and 5 simply bring certain provisions of the Bill into line with corresponding provisions of the Courts Reform Scotland Bill and the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014. Amendment 6 requires Scottish Ministers to consult the President of the Scottish Tribunals and um, such other persons as they consider appropriate before making tribunal rules. Amendment 89 relates to the eligibility for the appointment of the, ta the President of the Tax Tribunals and the intention is to align the criteria with those for legal members of the Upper Tax Tribunal. Finally, Amendment 92 gives effect to a recommendation of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee by providing that any rules made by Scottish Ministers as to the procedure to be followed in, in proceedings at a fitness assessment tribunal are to be published. I believe these amendments are minor and sensible adjustments. I move Amendment 3. Thank you. Ian Gray. Thank you, Deputy President. Now, sir, I rise simply to welcome these amendments and support them. Uh, they uh, firstly bring the Bill into line with corresponding provisions in the Court Reform Scotland uh, Bill, and that seems uh, right and proper, with the effect that such cases uh, that will be in the Upper Tribunal will have the same powers in relation to the petition as the Court of Session would have had. And in particular, uh, we wish to support Amendment 89, which brings the criteria for the appointment of the President of Tax Tribunals into line with the criteria of the appointment of legal members of the Upper Tribunal. This uh, rightly ensures that a person is eligible for appointment only if that person has the qualifications, experience and training in relation to tax law and practice that Scottish Ministers consider uh, appropriate. These are welcome amendments and we support them. Nigel Don. One for Mr Don, please. Thank you. Uh, I rise as convener of the uh, Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee just to thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking on board our comments. It's certainly a principle which we have adhered to in recent times that we would like to see all guidance published. Uh, there just seems to be no good reason why that should not be the case. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking that on board. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, to wind up, please. I welcome the comments that uh, Mr Don and Mr Gray have made. I, I think these amendments uh, bring these provisions into line with other uh, elements of statute and uh, I think strengthen the Bill as a consequence. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Now call Amendments 4, 5 and 6 on the name of the Cabinet Secretary and then invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. Uh, does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you'd like to move it, please. Uh, moved on block, President. Officer. Thank you. Does any member object to this being moved on block? As no member does, uh, the question is that amendments 4, 5 and 6 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Speak up, please. Thank you. Uh, I now call Group 3 and call Amendment 7 in the name of Cabinet Secretary and a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 7, please. President Officer, Amendment 7 addresses an issue which was raised by the Finance Committee in its Stage 1 report on the Bill and by Mr Chisholm at Stage 2. It relates to Condition B of the General Anti-Avoidance Rule, which provides that a tax avoidance arrangement is artificial if the arrangement lacks economic or commercial substance. This amendment, together with those which the Finance Committee has already approved at Stage 2, would put it beyond doubt that Condition B of the General Anti-Avoidance Rule extends to transactions between individuals as well as con commercial transactions between companies. I believe that clarifying the scope of the GAR in this way is a useful and sensible amendment, and I am grateful to Mr Chisholm for raising this point at Stage 2 consideration of the Bill. I move Amendment 7. Many thanks, Ian Gray.
Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I simply uh, rise to support Amendment 7 and welcome the Cabinet Secretary's uh, uh, recognition of the concerns that were raised at both stages by committee uh, and which he has now uh, responded to. As he says, uh, this amendment puts uh, beyond doubt that Condition B uh, of the General Anti-Avoidance Rule uh, applies to arrangements and transactions sorry, between individuals as well as companies or businesses. That is the point that Mr Chisholm pursued uh, during stage two, and uh, we are delighted the Scottish Government has recognised it and made the required amendment. Many thanks. Cabinet Secretary, anything further to add? Uh, nothing further to add. Thank you. And so the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. We now move to Group 4, and I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Groups, other amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 8 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. President Officer, I move Amendment 8 and will speak to it together with the other amendments in this group. Although there are a large number of amendments in this group, they are all for a single purpose. That is to insert new sections into the Bill and the two tax-specific acts which provide that any notice, application or other communication from a taxpayer to Revenue Scotland must be in the form and manner and contain the information specified by Revenue Scotland. This in turn makes it possible to remove a large number of specific references throughout the Bill and the two previous acts which require notices to be in writing. I have always made it clear that we want to put a tax system in place which is simple to operate and user-friendly for taxpayers and their agents. These amendments will give Revenue Scotland the flexibility to provide for secure electronic communication with taxpayers and their agents, while still allowing for, for paper or other forms of communication in appropriate cases. I move Amendment 8. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are. Thank you. I call Amendments 9 to 16. In the name of the Cabinet Secretary and previously debated, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. It moved on block, President Officer. Many thanks. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as it appears that no one does, the question is that amendments 9 to 16 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Now I move to Group 5 and call Amendment 17 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 17, please. Officer, I move Amendment 17. Section 78 currently provides that a taxpayer must pay any tax which is due when Revenue Scotland gives a notice of amendment under Section 78. This is not quite right, as the point at which payment is due should be when the taxpayer receives the notice, not when Revenue Scotland issues it. Amendment 17 makes this change, and I move this amendment. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thanks very much. Now call Amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Please. It moved, President Officer. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. Now start on Group 6 and call Amendment 19 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, if you could move Amendment 19 and speak to all other amendments in the group, please. President Officer, I move Amendment 19 and will speak to it together with the other amendments in this group. These 25 amendments are minor and technical in nature and in general improve the clarity and consistency of the provisions in the Bill and also improve the interface between the overarching framework of the Bill and the first two tax-specific Acts. Amendment 124 ensures that the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014, when it is in force, applies to Revenue Scotland in the same way in which it will apply to other public bodies in Scotland. I move Amendment 19. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. I call Amendments 20 to 26, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. It moved on block, President. Many Officer. thanks. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as it appears that no, no one does, the question is that Amendment 20 to 26 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Many thanks. We are. Call Group 7 and call Amendment 27 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 27, please. Uh, President Officer, I move Amendment 27. Section 94.4a imposes a three-year time limit after a taxpayer has died for Revenue Scotland issuing an assessment to the taxpayer's personal representatives. This amendment brings the time limit applying to an information notice given in connection with a deceased uh, taxpayer into line with that section. I move Amendment 27. Thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. 
now move to Group 8 and call Amendment 28 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group to Amendment 29. Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 28 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. President Officer, I move Amendment 28 and will speak to it together with Amendment 29. Section 140 provides a power to enter business premises and take samples of material, but as the Bill stands, it is not supported by a penalty. On reflection, I think it is right that a person who obstructs, who obstructs a designated officer in the exercise of this power should be liable to a penalty under Section 167. Amendment 28 provides for this by bringing the power to take samples of material and premises within the scope of a designated officer's powers under Section 135A. This means we no longer need a power of entry coupled to the power to take samples. Section 1671B provides that a person is liable to a penalty for obstructing an officer exercising any power under Section 135A. Amendment 29 is consequential on Amendment 28, which I now move. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. Call Amendments 29 to 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block, please. It moved on block, President Officer. Many thanks. And does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as it appears that no one does, the question is that amendments 29 to 38 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. We now move to Group 9 and call Amendment 39 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with Amendments 40, 40 to 44. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 39 and speak to the other amendments in the group, please. President Officer, I move Amendment 39 and will speak to it together with the other amendments in this group. Amendments 39 and 40 address an issue which was raised by Gavin Brown at Stage 2 and concerns the date after which the taxpayer becomes liable to a penalty for late payment of tax. Uh, section 151 of the Bill currently provides that for both devolved taxes, the taxpayer becomes liable to a penalty for late payment of tax the day after payment is due. During Stage 2 consideration of the Bill, Mr Brown suggested this could be harsh and asked whether there was scope for flexibility. After giving the matter further consideration, I believe it would be fair to give the taxpayer 30 days to pay any overdue tax in relation to land and building transaction tax return before they become liable to a penalty for late payment. However, I do not believe that the same amendment is necessary in relation to a Scottish landfill tax return. Landfill operators will be required to make regular quarterly returns and so will be fully aware of their tax obligations. The amendments in this group will also give the taxpayer 30 days to pay tax due in relation to a Revenue Scotland amendment under Section 78 and a Revenue Scotland determination under Section 86 before they become liable to a penalty. At present, a penalty is imposed immediately in both cases. On reflection, I believe it would be fair to give the taxpayer 30 days to pay tax due before they become liable to a penalty for late payment. I am grateful once again to Mr Brown for raising this issue at Stage 2, and I move Amendment 39. Many thanks. I call Gavin Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to support these amendments and uh, to put on record the fact that I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for bringing them forward. Uh, the idea of an instant penalty did strike me as a little bit harsh in some cases, um, and I think the flexibility and changes that he brings forward today uh, strike the right balance, and I'm very pleased to support them. Many thanks. Cabinet Secretary, anything further to add? Uh, nothing further to add. Sorry, Many sir. thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. We now call Amendments 40 to 44, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, and previously debated by the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block, please. Uh, moved on block, President Officer. Many thanks. And does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? As it appears that no one does, the question is that Amendments 40 to 44 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Many thanks. I now move to Group 10 and call Amendment 45 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 45 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Mr. Officer, I move Amendment 45 and will speak to it together with the other amendments in this group. At Stage 2, a number of amendments are made to the Bill's Part 8 on penalties, including the addition of a number of new sections about penalties for failing to make a tax return and failing to pay tax. These amendments tidy up cross-references in Part 8 as a result of these new sections and also align Section 152 with the approach taken in Section 181B, which was added at Stage 2. I move Amendment 45. Many thanks. Uh, and so the question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
We are. Many thanks. And now call amendments 46 to 74 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and previously debated and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. It moved on block. Is there any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as again, as no one does, the question is that amendments 46 to 74 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Many thanks. Pages. Now move to group 11 and call amendment 75 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with amendments 80 and 97. Cabinet Secretary to move amendment 75. Please and speak to other amendments in the group. President Officer, I move Amendment 75 and will speak to it with other amendments in this group. Amendment 75 provides that any decision Revenue Scotland makes in relation to the registration of a person for tax purposes is both appealable and reviewable. Uh, this is particularly relevant to sections 22 and 23 of the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014. Amendment 80 corrects section 210 by providing that in certain circumstances the general rule that tax penalties and interest are payable pending review or appeal does not apply. Amendment 97 ensures consistency with the rule that all notices of appeal are given to the Tribunal and not Revenue Scotland. I move Amendment 75. Thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. I now call Amendment 76 to 97 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and previously debated and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block, please. It moved on block, President Officer. Many thanks. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as no one does, the question is that Amendment 76 to 97 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. Now move to Group 12 and call Amendment 98 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 98, please. President Officer, Amendment 98 amends the Debtor Scotland Act 1987 to ensure that the same enforcement machinery which is available to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs for the recovery of tax penalties and interest owed by taxpayers is also available to Revenue Scotland. The Bill provides ample opportunities for taxpayers to challenge decisions taken by Revenue Scotland if they disagree with them. But once legal liability for tax has finally been determined, if a taxpayer fails to pay the tax which is due, then Revenue Scotland should be able to enforce that debt effectively in the same way as HMRC. I move Amendment 98. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 98 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Many thanks. We now call Amendments 99 to 103 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block, please. It moved on block, presiding officer. Many thanks. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? As no one does, the question is that Amendments 99 to 103 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Many thanks. I now call Group 13 and call Amendments 104 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary group with other amendments as shown on the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, move one, Amendment 104 and speak to the other amendments in the group, please. President Officer, I move Amendment 104 and will speak to it together with the other amendments in this group. Schedule 4 of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill makes a number of final consequential amendments to both tax-specific acts to ensure that they fit together properly and seamlessly with the overarching framework set out in this bill. Amendments 104, 109 and 112 relate to amendments to the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Scotland Act 2013. Amendment 109 is the main substantive amendment in relation to these three amendments and concerns the recovery of LBTT reliefs. The reliefs in question are group relief, reconstruction relief and acquisition relief, all of which must be, complained by the ta must be claimed by the taxpayer in a land transaction return. The LBTT Act already provides for the withdrawal of these reliefs when the circumstances justifying relief are no longer in place, in which case the taxpayer must pay the tax for which they had earlier claimed. The legislative machinery introduced by Amendment 109 empowers Revenue Scotland to recover these sums of tax and makes appropriate adjustments to the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill for that purpose. Amendments 114, 115, 119 and 123 relate to amendments to the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014. Amendment 119, which allows for the alignment of waste data return periods and Scottish landfill tax return periods, was proposed in the consultation paper we published in May 2014 on Scottish landfill tax subordinate legislation. I can confirm to Parliament that our proposals for aligning environmental and tax returns were welcomed by stakeholders. 
Aligning the periods will allow for greater clarity when conducting compliance checks and greater IT synergies between SEPA and Revenue Scotland, while hopefully reducing some of the administrative burden on landfill operators. The other amendment in this group that I would draw particular attention to is Amendment 114, which will allow the forthcoming Scottish landfill tax regulations to penalise failures to use waybridges. The aim here is to deter landfill operators taking advantage of using alternative methods of calculating weight when there is a working waybridge on site. Amendment 123 ensures that any penalty provisions included in regulations are subject to the affirmative procedure. I move Amendment 104. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And so I now call Amendments 105 to 124 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and previously debated. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block, please. Many thanks. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as no one does, the question is that Amendments 105 to 124 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Excellent. And that ends consideration of amendments. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10822 in the name of John Swinney on the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes or thereby, please. Officer, the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill has two main purposes. First of all, it establishes Revenue Scotland as the tax authority which will be responsible for the collection and management of the two devolved taxes when they come into operation on 1 April 2015. These are Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and Scottish Landfill Tax. And of course, the first two spe tax specific acts are already on the statute book. Second, it sets out in one place the statutory framework within which Revenue Scotland will operate. That includes the Constitution of Revenue Scotland, the relationship between the taxpayer and the tax authority, Revenue Scotland's investigation and enforcement powers, and the new two-tier Scottish tax tribunals to hear appeals against decisions taken by Revenue Scotland. It also includes a robust and distinctive approach to tackling tax avoidance, about which I will say more in a moment. President Officer, I'm grateful for the very detailed and thorough scrutiny which the Finance Committee has undertaken at stages one and two. Many of the amendments which have been made to the Bill at Stages 2 and 3 reflect recommendations from both the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The Bill has been significantly improved during its parliamentary passage as a result, and I would like to put on record my thanks to both committees for the work that they have done. We have also taken the opportunity at Stage 3 to bring forward a significant number of minor and technical amendments which are designed to improve the clarity and consistency of the Bill and the interface between the overarching framework and the first two tax-specific acts. I believe that these final amendments provide greater clarity, coherence and consistency across the full package of devolved tax legislation. I would, like to take, I would like to take a few moments to highlight some of the distinctive aspects of the new framework for the collection and management of devolved taxes. Part two of the bill provides for the establishment of Revenue Scotland as an office holder in the Scottish Administration, which means it will be directly accountable to the Parliament and not Ministers. The bill sets out Revenue Scotland's statutory functions with an emphasis on providing a service to taxpayers and their agents and not just collecting the devolved taxes. The bill also places a duty on Revenue Scotland to prepare and publish a charter setting out the standards of behaviour and values which will be expected of taxpayers and which taxpayers can expect of Revenue Scotland. Revenue Scotland is required to consult on the terms of the Charter, and that will provide a genuine opportunity for input from stakeholders and the wider public about the nature of the relationship between the taxpayer and the tax authority. Part 4 of the Bill establishes the Scottish Tax Tribunals, which will comprise a first tier and an upper tier under the leadership of a President. As colleagues will recall, the Parliament recently passed the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014, which paves the way for the establishment of the new unified Scottish tribunals. The intention is that early in 2017, the tax tribunals will become part of the Scottish tribunals. However, arrangements need to be in place to hear appeals about the devolved taxes from the 1st of April 2015. And therefore, we need to establish self-standing tax tribunals for an interim period until the new unified arrangements are fully operational. Part 5 of the bill sets out a general anti-avoidance rule, the GAR. I'm sure I have, the support across the, I have support across the Chamber for establishing a Scottish general anti-avoidance rule, which makes the most robust 
possible approach to tax avoidance in relation to any devolved taxes. Artificial tax avoidance arrangements are unacceptable and Part 5 of the Bill provides for Revenue Scotland to take effective counteraction against any such schemes. The Bill provides two separate definitions of artificiality, Condition A and Condition B, to make sure that our approach is as wide-ranging and comprehensive as possible. Condition A allows Revenue Scotland to take counteraction where a tax avoidance arrangement is not a reasonable course of action, having regard to the principles and policy objectives on which the relevant tax legislation is based, and to whether the arrangement is intended to exploit any shortcomings in that legislation. This will allow Revenue Scotland, the Scottish Tax Tribunals and the Courts to look at the spirit and the intention of tax legislation and not just the strict letter of the law. I believe that this uh, purposive, purposive uh, approach to legislation, supported by clearer guidance by Revenue Scotland, to which the courts and tribunals must have regard, will make it possible to defeat ingenious but artificial and contrived avoidance schemes far more effectively than has previously been the case. Condition B allows Revenue Scotland to take counteraction against tax avoidance arrangements which lack either economic or commercial substance. It also sets out a number of examples which might indicate that an arrangement lacks economic or commercial substance. For example, if it is carried out in a manner which would not normally be employed in reasonable business conduct or consists of transactions which are circular in nature. The amendments which the Parliament has passed at Stage 3 further reinforce this approach by making it clear that the test relating to a lack of economic or commercial substance applies to transactions between individuals as well as commercial transactions between companies. And I'm grateful to Mr Chisholm for raising this point at stage two. President officer, I believe that the approach we have adopted for tackling tax avoidance is based on straightforward common sense tests that ordinary taxpayers would understand and endorse. I envisage that the robust approach we have adopted towards tax avoidance in the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill would extend in very much the same way if we take the opportunity to become responsible for other taxes in the future. Throughout the Bill, we have tried to strike a fair balance between the taxpayer on the one hand and the tax authority on the other. With that in mind, the Bill ensures that taxpayers will have various opportunities to challenge decisions taken by Revenue Scotland without having to resort to expensive legal action. First, they will be able to ask Revenue Scotland to carry out an internal review which will be undertaken by a person not associated with the original decision. If that does not resolve the dispute, Revenue Scotland and the taxpayer will be able to enter into independent third-party mediation if both parties agree to do so. And finally, there will be a right of access to the new two-tier Scottish tax tribunals and ultimately, on a point of law, to the Court of Session. I believe these arrangements are robust and credible and will provide Scottish taxpayers with confidence in the administration of devolved taxes. Part 8 of the Bill sets out a penalties regime. In response to recommendations from both the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, we brought forward amendments at stages 2 and 3 to set out the detail of the penalties regime in full on the face of the Bill, including all penalty amounts. At the same time, the Bill provides the flexibility to make changes to the penalties regime by order, subject to affirmative procedure, if that should prove necessary in the light of experience. The process of implementing the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill will involve putting in place a significant amount of subordinate legislation by the 1st of April 2015, when Revenue Scotland comes into being. I intend to publish a consultation paper later this year, accompanied by drafts of all of the subordinate, leg subordinate legislation, which needs to be put in place by the 1st of April 2015. That will provide a full opportunity for consultation with interested parties well before draft orders are laid before Parliament early in the new year. We have already published consultation papers setting out the proposed uh, subordinate legislation for land and buildings transaction tax and the Scottish landfill tax. President officer, whilst we are only assuming responsibility for the collection and management of a small proportion of taxation, it is a new and exciting opportunity for the Scottish Parliament. Throughout the process, there has been extensive consultation with the tax and legal professions as well as other stakeholders. The Tax Consultation Forum and the Devolved Tax Collaborative, which we established, have been closely involved throughout the process. We will maintain this open and consultative approach as we move towards the implementation of the devolved taxes on the 1st of April 2015. 
In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I thank the Finance Committee once again for the very positive and constructive approach which has been taken throughout the parliamentary passage of the Bill. The Bill, as passed at Stage 3, is, the much, is much the better for it. I believe that it provides a robust framework for the collection and management of the first two devolved taxes when they come into force on the 1st of April 2015, and also a solid foundation that we can build upon in the event of this Parliament becoming responsible for a wider range of taxes. President Officer, I move that the Parliament agrees that the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill be passed. Many thanks. And I now call on Ian Gray. Seven minutes or thereby, please. <coughs> Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Um, in the Stage 1 debate on this bill, I quoted, as I do whenever given the opportunity, <laughs> Albert Einstein, who said, the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax. There you go. I quoted him again. Uh, I doubt that Einstein ever had to worry about land and buildings transaction tax, or certainly not landfill tax. So we can probably assume that he was really talking about the complexity of tax uh, in general. And indeed, looking back at that stage one debate, um, most of us began by noting how dull tax legislation is considered to be uh, and how complicated it turns out it actually uh, is. Although uh, I have this afternoon spotted at least one accountant of my acquaintance drawn to the public gallery by our deliberations. Uh, so these things are, of course, a matter of taste. And perhaps it's a, a sign of the times uh, we live in that today's debate, technical, pragmatic and above all consensual, feels rather like light relief this time from what passes for political discourse uh, the rest of the time at the moment. The fact is that although we began with a shared purpose of creating Revenue Scotland in order to administer and manage uh, the devolved taxes, landfill tax and land and building trans transaction tax, in spite of that consensus and shared purpose, it still turned out sometimes to be a complex tax task to get it right. Uh, all the more reason then to congratulate uh, firstly the Bill team for their work in drafting and redrafting the legislation to get us to the position uh, we're in today, where I think we can be sure that the Bill will be passed overwhelmingly, indeed unanimously, at decision time. The committee uh, on which I don't sit deserves our thanks too, uh, firstly for taking comprehensive, complicated and exhaustive evidence on the Bill at pre-legislative stage, uh, and for also dealing with some 300 amendments at stage two uh, of the bill's consideration. And I also want to, perhaps unusually for me, uh, praise the efforts of the Cabinet Secretary for steering uh, this legislation through, including another 140 amendments today, so almost uh, 450 since his original uh, draft. And although we did deal uh, in pretty short order with 140 amendments this afternoon, uh, those amendments have included some significant improvements in response to the scrutiny of the bill by the committee, uh, which I will mention in a moment. But we should also note, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary did once again, that this uh, marks not just as completion of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, but our completion of a trilogy of linked bills which create the first devolved national taxes and the body to administer and manage them. And that, then, is a significant task we are completing today. And I'm tempted to say to the Cabinet Secretary that, uh, apart from pursuing the important matter of a future for Ferguson Shipyard, he should perhaps take the next few weeks off, put his feet up and stay out of trouble. But I expect that he has other plans, which is a pity in a way, <clears throat> because the task he is completing today is real proof of the power and flexibility of the devolution settlement he will, in fact, I fear, spend the next four weeks trying his best to destroy. The three bills of which this is the third uh, are derived, of course, from the Calman process and the consequent Scotland Act. They constitute, therefore, a significant step forward in rebalancing the devolution settlement by securing new fiscal powers and decision-making for this Parliament without breaking the social, economic and political union with the rest of the UK, which provides us with such significant opportunities. Nonetheless, consensus for today on this bill. That consensus started with the approach taken to creating a new tax system, the fundamental principle. The Cabinet Secretary 
made much of his starting point as being Adam Smith's four maxims for a tax system, certainty, convenience, efficiency, uh, and proportionate, proportionality to the ability to pay. And rightly so, and he has had support from across the chamber for this principle-based approach to this legislation. And it's been interesting, I think, to see how turning those maxims into detailed legislation is less straightforward than might have been assumed, in that they can sometimes contradict themselves. But I do think that some of those 400-odd amendments have certainly take us, taken us in the right direction. For example, we now have greater certainty uh, over penalties on the face of the bill. And most importantly, amendments both at stage two and again today have made the definitions of what constitutes tax avoidance much clearer uh, and more certain. And as the Cabinet Secretary knows, we've supported uh, his approach uh, to tax avoidance from the start, agreeing with him that we should have a general anti-avoidance rule rather than a general anti-abuse rule. We agreed that the double reasonable test should be avoided, that the test should be of artificiality rather than abusiveness, uh, and that uh, arrangements for tax avoidance is one of the reasons, not just the sole or main reason, should also be caught uh, by the general rule. In other words, we agree with the Cabinet Secretary that the net should be cast wider than in previous legislation, and that indeed it has been. However, we have throughout the process pursued further clarity, notably through Mr Chisholm and committee, and I am glad to acknowledge once again that the Cabinet Secretary has now put it beyond doubt that the general rule applies to transactions between individuals as well as companies or businesses. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, in his uh, own remarks, uh, made reference to the consultations, guidance and secondary legislation uh, which will uh, be consequent on the passing of this bill this evening. So we should acknowledge that there is still work to be done. And indeed, we will not know if this legislation meets the maximum of efficiency until it's tested in action, nor certainty until consequent guidance and secondary legislation is completed, nor indeed proportionality until tax rates are actually announced, although that will have to happen quite soon now, as the Cabinet Secretary must know. However, uh, we can claim today a good piece of legislation, improved by the legislative process, and one which can, should and will, I'm sure, be supported at decision time this evening. Many thanks. I uh, now call on Gavin Brown. Five minutes or thereby, please, Mr Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Being involved uh, with this bill has been both interesting and rewarding, and I'm extremely grateful to Professor McEwen, who gave expert advice to the Finance Committee, and to all, or, all other stakeholders who gave roundtable uh, discussions, who gave formal evidence, and who wrote in uh, to try and explain some of the finer complexities of tax. Um, Ian Gray quite rightly quoted the maxims of Smith, and all of those maxims on their own have great merit, but I think what has been very interesting to see in practice is trying to obey all of those maxims at the same time is far trickier in practice than it is in theory. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think the biggest criticism that was made of the bill um, at stage one against, I think, uh, praise for most of the bill was a section on penalties. It was an area where I think things hadn't been done quite rightly. And there was a pretty strong view among stakeholders that the circumstances, the amounts and the factors to be taken into account really ought to be on the face of the bill and you could leave procedure and administration for secondary legislation. This is something I think then acknowledged by the bill team, acknowledged too by the Cabinet Secretary uh, during the course of the stage one debate. And then quite helpfully and quite rightly, a raft of amendments were lodged uh, by the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 2. Um, I think now the penalties uh, provisions are far clearer and have a far broader support uh, than they would have done uh, had they been left as they were at Stage 1. Just to go through a couple of examples, Section 150, for example, of the Bill, failure to make a return. Uh, previously, uh, there was no amount attached to that, and it simply gave the power uh, to the Government to produce um, uh, regulations in relation to that. Now, though, with the amendments that were passed at stage two, there are firm amounts put on what would be paid in the absence of a return. And I think also quite helpfully, they have divided it into time periods. So if you're three months late, six months late, or 12 months late, uh, there is different treatment and different penalties. 
and also at the same time they have split uh, the penalties amongst the two taxes. There is a slightly different regime uh, for land and buildings transaction tax as compared uh, to the landfill tax. So I think section 150, as one example now, it does what it ought to do in t giving some certainty, but I think as the Cabinet Secretary said, still allowing the government a degree of flexibility by order should circumstances uh, prove to be necessary. If you take something like section 151, section 160, just as another example, uh, penalty for error um, in your tax return. Again, previously there was no amount set out at all. It was simply a case um, of there could be regulations brought forward at some point. Now there is a clear percentage set out as what that penalty might be as against the tax. And again, also I think quite helpfully, they have split it into two categories. Those where there is a deliberate inaccuracy by the person completing the return uh, and the other category of where the inaccuracy is deemed to be careless as opposed to deliberate. Those two are treated separately as I think most people would argue they ought to be. So we now have, have a situation I think which is consistent, which hangs together and which I think uh, makes sense uh, to the taxpayer. So all of those uh, were welcomed at the time and I welcome them again now. Um, during the course of amendments this afternoon, the Cabinet Secretary again touched on the issue of a penalty for failure to pay tax. Um, the amendment, of course, was passed uh, by all in the Chamber today. But I think, again, I, I had some concerns how it was before, um, where there was effectively an instant penalty um, if, it wasn't, if the tax wasn't paid on or indeed before the due date. Um, I think that was a little bit harsh. The Cabinet Secretary did agree to, agree to uh, reflect upon this and that uh, came out, I think, in a very good amendment or set of amendments today so that taxpayers, at least in the case of LBTT, now have 30 days uh, to pay the penalty. Um, a couple of other miscellaneous points I think worth dwelling on. The first one is that there was some uh, criticism before about the, ch the idea of the charter. Um, the charter uh, as it was first drafted, or at least the, as the bill was first drafted, seemed to put a slightly greater obligation on the taxpayer than it did on Revenue Scotland. Uh, taxpayers had to obey, uh, Revenue Scotland had to aspire to uh, the Charter. Again, this was changed, I think quite rightly, by the Government. Now both sides have to adhere to the Charter um, so that there is reciprocity as opposed to the balance all being in favour of Revenue Scotland. And I suppose just the last thing to touch on again is the fact that uh, both, the, uh, both committees that looked at this felt there had to be, uh, if ministerial guidance was given uh, to Revenue Scotland, this had to be made public, and this was reflected again in an amendment today, uh, which makes it very clear that any ministerial guidance will be laid before this Parliament. So on that basis, uh, presenting officer, the bill, I think, started off well. I think it has been improved, as the Cabinet Secretary said, and of course, uh, we will uh, happily support it at decision time today. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to the open debate, and I call on the first of the open debate speakers, Mr Gibson, four minutes to be followed by Michael McMahon. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to begin by thanking the people who have been involved in the Bill's progress. The members of the Finance Committee, our clerks, the Committee's advisor, uh, Professor Gavin McEwen, who has rightly already been uh, mentioned by, by Gavin Brown, and the organisations and individuals who took the time to respond to the consultation and indeed give evidence on the Bill earlier this year. It has been a long road, and from the outset, the Finance Committee was aware of the complexities involved in a bill of this nature, and as the committee's convener, I was conscious of the close scrutiny necessary. The technicalities of this bill have been reflected in the large proportion of committee time dedicated to it. And as members know, the Scotland Act 2012 devolved the power to raise taxes on land transactions and on waste disposal to landfill. With the passage of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, important changes to the Scottish taxation landscape will be implemented and this bill will make provision for a Scottish tax system to collect and manage the land and buildings transaction tax and the Scottish landfill tax. Furthermore, the bill will establish Revenue Scotland, a new non-ministerial department, as of 1st of April next year. Microphone, this department Mr. Gibson. will be the new tax authority responsible for collecting Scotland's involved taxes. And additionally, this bill will also create Scottish tax tribunals. Apologies, actually. I That's can tell much how much attention everyone had been paying to my speech by the fact that I'm about a third of the way through so and was just folks suddenly noticed quiet. that one. They couldn't actually hear me. That's a great vote of confidence. I'll just sit down now, perhaps. Uh, where was I, presiding officer? Well, under the remit of this bill, the relationship between the tax authority and taxpayers will be clarified. Indeed, I'm optimistic this bill uh, satisfactorily creates a strong statutory framework for 
uh, future devolved taxes, clearly defining the duties, rights and powers of both the tax authority and taxpayers. And this is strongly underpinned by the principles of anti-avoidance and the creation of the anti-avoidance rule, uh, enabling a new Revenue Scotland to com combat avoidance schemes which permit tax advantages. Uh, this is a provision strongly supported by the Finance Committee and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth. And since we last debate the bill in the Chamber, the Finance Committee has considered amendments put forward as part of Stage 2, more than 300 number, as Ian Gray pointed out. And this involved a lengthy session with the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth and his officials. And the Cabinet Secretary showed uh, the importance of, uh, of keeping fit as he nimbly responded to uh, this myriad of amendments. Many of these amendments were minor, technical or consequential, and most concerned the drafting of the bill included clarifications such as that members of the Northern Irish and Welsh devolved bodies are, unlike the Scottish and UK equivalents, not eligible to stand for Revenue Scotland appointments, uh, that Revenue Scotland must specifically address taxpayers and their agents in providing assistance and information, and, and uh, also clarifying tribunal, tribunal procedures in accordance with the new Tribunal of Scotland Act 2014. Other amendments were made following the Committee's own scrutiny and subsequent recommendations. Of note is the Section 10 Charter of Standards and Values and Section 13 Use of Information by Revenue Scotland. The agreed amendments will further protect taxpayer confidential information and ensure the new Revenue Scotland performs in an ethically sound manner. Importantly, the general anti-avoidance framework was simplified following feedback from the Committee's consultations. Previously, three types of Revenue Scotland officer have been proposed. However, this has been refined and reduced to one. And Revenue Scotland officers will now have the required specialist skills and level of seniority to adequately deal uh, with matters before them. And this will ensure that procedures uh, uh, will um, be dealt with and uh, will eliminate unnecessary bureaucracy. With the support of the committee and the cabinet secretary and contributors such as the Scottish Trade Union Congress in unison, further amendments were added to the general anti-avoidance rule. As a fundamental cornerstone of this bill, these amendments were carefully uh, considered and in all these changes better secure the robustness of the legislation, uh, ensuring a fair uh, piece of legislation. I would like to conclude presenting also by um, restating my uh, firm support uh, for the transfer of financial powers to the Scottish Parliament and reiterate my thanks to my fellow committee members and all contributors, but also notably the bill team, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth. And I believe that this bill marks an important milestone catering for the provision of future tax decisions made in Scotland. It has been taken forward, uh, presenting officer, in a very positive way by all parties across this chamber, uh, and indeed exemplified by the fact that there are no divisions at stage three here today. And I'm sure I speak for all my finance committee uh, colleagues when I say that this legislation has only relished and indeed whetted the appetite uh, for further uh, tax legislation in the months and years ahead. Many thanks. I now call on Michael McMahon to be followed by Willie Rennie. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. According to Dennis Healy, the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion is the thickness of a prison wall. The former Chancellor was absolutely right, for while tax avoidance is simply clever financial planning, tax evasion is illegal. So it's understandable that at a time when high profile millionaire celebrities and multinational companies um, the have uh, been highlighted, the focus of deliberations on taxation is on this issue. It has become quite apparent that the public care more deeply than ever that we do not have a tax system that permits freeloaders. So I think the Scottish Government has got the balance just about right in legislating on how Revenue Scotland will be tasked with dealing with avoidance and evasion within its responsibilities. There is flexibility within the rules, but still enough clarity that the rules are firm enough to follow. And the amendments that have been accepted uh, and brought forward by the Cabinet Secretary, I think, have uh, helped uh, to clarify some areas that originally there was some doubt. Because we had to get this right, there are serious implications for business in particular as a whole as a result of tax avoidance. There are also implications for the public perception of our tax system, which must maintain public confidence as the perception that others can avoid their responsibilities can damage that confidence. So the clear view of those tax professionals who gave evidence to the Finance Committee indicated to me that the level of public scrutiny 10 years ago was much less than it is now, but that tax avoidance itself is not necessarily any greater than it was in years gone by. However, the public's greater awareness of all of these issues means that when certain individuals or companies aren't contributing their fair share to the public purse, there is a heightened sense of outrage. And those concerns are justified so where avoidance is taking place, we do have to make it easier 
to take action, and I believe this, uh, this bill does that. I think that in relation to the landfill tax especially, any avoidance could create economic distortions as a business could seek a competitive advantage by acting illegally to avoid paying tax. Now, I visited the new SEPA premises at the Maximum Development and Eurocentral in my constituency. I was very pleased to see the dedicated team of investigators who have been tasked with pursuing companies who, by many and varied means, are seeking to avoid paying landfill tax. That effort is already bearing fruit, and I am confident that it will in increasingly clamp down on those who try to dodge their responsibilities. So I have no hesitation in endorsing the bill and congratulate the Cabinet Secretary for guiding it so effectively to this point. I would also like to thank the Convener of the Finance Committee and the Advisor to the Finance Committee for the efforts that were made to ensure that this very technical and complex issue uh, passed through its process as smoothly as possible. But I know that the Cabinet Secretary from our ex exchanges earlier this afternoon gets concerned when I break the consensus. So I won't let him down. I will ask a question which you know, it has occurred to me. Because this bill and the two others which resulted from the further devolution of tax powers under the Scotland Act sailed through the legislative process on a sea of goodwill and widespread agreement. However, the Cabinet Secretary came to the Finance Committee last week and his exasperation was evident that closure on the technical details of the block grant adjustment, which is required under the new tax laws, has not yet been achieved. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us if you can't conclude the process for a system covering only 1.7% of Scotland's income in 18 months, with all the parties involved in total agreement on their desirability and efficacy, how on earth do you expect to negotiate, agree and deliver an entire transfer of powers, set up and conclude applications for membership of NATO and the EU and other bodies, set up a currency union and all within 18 months of a yes vote in September? Now, I don't expect the Cabinet Secretary to answer that or have to answer that because it's purely a hypothetical question. But I do thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for his efforts in bringing this particular devolved tax to fruition. And I look forward to seeing how Revenue Scotland uh, take forward the, the powers that have been given to them uh, to the betterment of our system of taxation in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Willie Rennie to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm grateful too to the work of the, the committee, the advisers, the clerks, the officials uh, within the government for their quite detailed work over quite a long period of time. It's quite striking today that the debate this afternoon contrasts remarkably to the debate that we had just a few months ago on this very bill. Um, it actually also contrasts very much from earlier on this afternoon, where we were all very heated. I felt the, kind of, the early adrenaline rush just evaporate uh, as this uh, debate um, concluded. Uh, but it does show that I think the effectiveness of devolution and the effectiveness of this parliament, the value of devolution also. This is a consequence of the 2012 Scotland Act, a direct consequence of that. It's also finally, I think, a precursor to what I want to see as more powers for this parliament transferred right here to Holyrood perhaps only if there's a vote next month. But also, I think the bill today sets an important foundation for what I want to see as an expansion on income tax, also on capital gains tax, inheritance tax, and many other areas, so that this parliament raises the majority of the money that it spends. But also, I presume, for those on the SNP benches, it would set a foundation uh, for independence. So therefore, I think the aspirations that were set down initially when this bill was first proposed and Revenue Scotland was first proposed to save quite significant sums of money, I think £250 million was mentioned because we'd have a much more simple, flexible, um, agile system of tax collection in comparison um, with HMRC. So those ambitions, I think, will be tested on the two relatively small taxes that we will be responsible for initially and I think everybody will be watching very closely to make sure that those bold ambitions that were set initially when this announcement was made for Revenue Scotland will be met even if it is in a minor way because I think what this bill has uh, revealed as Ian Gray um, quite eloquently pointed out was with 450 or so amendments 
Raising tax isn't a simple business. People on the other side who want to avoid tax are smart people who will spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to avoid that tax. So we will have to work extremely hard and be extremely agile to make sure that we are as effective, if not more effective, as HMRC. Because HMRC has made some progress in recent years. They've managed to make 40 changes in tax law since 2010, and many of the loopholes have been closed. But it's an ongoing process to make sure that those who want to avoid tax are caught and make their contribution. Because ultimately what we want to see here is public services that are properly funded, adequately funded to make sure that we get the services that we deserve and that we need. I've got great hopes um, for this bill. I think it's a good piece of work. I'm hoping that it will be as effective as those who proposed it initially um, claimed that it would be. Uh, and with that, I pledge our party's support this afternoon. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call John Mason. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to be able to take part uh, in this debate this afternoon. Now, taxation may not be everyone's most exciting topic, but I do find it extremely interesting. And this legislation is particularly significant as it is to become the underpinning legislation as we move forward, whatever the constitutional settlement. As I think I said when I spoke on this subject in May, one of the problems of UK tax legislation has been its emphasis on the letter of the law as against the spirit or intention of the law. As a result, we have situations where the wider public was clear that tax should have been paid, but some taxpayers have avoided tax in quite an artificial way, and that has been referred to already in this debate. This is particularly galling for ordinary members of the public who, whether employed, self-employed or retired, are pretty strictly regulated by the various tax authorities. Therefore, I do welcome the more principles-based approach which we are seeing in this legislation, and hopefully we will see that in future Scottish tax bills. While on the subject of principles, I'm also happy to welcome, as others have done, the emphasis on Adam Smith's maxims, eh, which have been referred to eh, to various extents. In particular, quote, the burden proportionate to the ability to pay, unquote. Now, we did have some discussion at committee on the intricacies of this and the difference between proportionate and proportional, which have now escaped me, I have to say. But uh, it's certainly clear that there are some taxes, like council tax, which are really not linked to the ability to pay, except in the loosest possible sense. So hopefully, as we move forward, we can remember this principle and future new and amended taxes will be more proportionate. Also, we have had the issue of certainty, and that has come up many times as we consider the bill, and that is one of Adam Smith's maxims, which I think we all support. However, I continue to think that the demand for certainty can sometimes be a smokescreen, meaning really more certainty for those who want to avoid paying tax. Therefore, I personally am very supportive of the Cabinet Secretary's insistence that we stick to this principles-based approach, including having the wider general anti-avoidance rule than seems to be the case in the UK. Now, clearly only two relatively small taxes are being fully devolved, while income tax is not really being devolved at all, with only partial control over one aspect of it. And that could, frankly, give us the worst of both worlds. An already complex UK income tax system would become more complex and therefore more expensive to operate. That is the downside of devolution, and in particular the downside of sharing a tax rather than devolving it. Another factor in all this is the block grant adjustment, which Michael McMahon already referred to. It is disappointing that having promised to devolve these two taxes, it now seems that Westminster is attempting to backtrack and keep its hands on as much of them as it possibly can. This does not bode well for the vague assertion that more tax powers might, or may, or could, or should possibly, at some stage, given the right circumstances, and given the right government at Westminster, and on the assumption that the UK does not leave the EU and does not go completely bankrupt, such taxes might be devolved in the event of a no vote. But I prefer to be optimistic and look forward to our taking control over the whole range of taxes as normal countries do. We will probably have to start off by modifying the UK system, but at some stage we will have the challenge and also the opportunity to write our own legislation for these major taxes and I look forward to that exercise. But the great thing about what we are doing today is we are setting out a direction of travel. 
We want to do things our way and in a way that fits Scotland's needs. I think this is a very good start with this bill and I wholeheartedly support its approval. Many thanks. That then brings us to the closing speeches and I call on Gavin Brown. Four minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. If that was John Mason being optimistic, I hope I'm not here the day when John Mason is pessimistic uh, about the tax system. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, this has been, I think quite rightly, a broadly consensual debate uh, with little areas uh, for the Chamber to divide, both obviously at Stage 2 and indeed today at Stage 3. I was struck by something the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening remarks, where he, I think, pointed out just how much subordinate legislation is going to have to flow, not just from this bill, but from the other two tax bills that we passed uh, earlier this year and at the end of last year. For all three, there is bound to be a raft of regulation. And in some ways, I think today is just a bit of a starting point. There is more work to be done now on this bill and indeed on the other two than we have probably done so far. And all of it, of course, has to be done and completed by the 1st of April of next year. So there is a huge amount for the government to do, for Parliament to do, and indeed for all of those involved in taxation in Scotland over the coming months. And I think probably the first test, the first true test of Revenue Scotland's performance and way of doing business will come in terms of the charter, again, to which the Cabinet Secretary referred. In terms of Section 10 of the Bill, Revenue Scotland has to create a charter of standards and values. Now, I think, the, as I indicated earlier, the section has been boosted up by bringing in reciprocity uh, between Revenue Scotland and, indeed, taxpayers. But in terms of pulling that charter together, um, Revenue Scotland are to consult those who they think are relevant. And I think that will be the first challenge for them. How are they going to consult over what this charter ought to look like? Who are they going to consult? And are they going to take a proactive approach to it or a reactive approach? I think everybody will be looking very carefully because how the charter is constructed, I think, will tee up how Revenue Scotland performs over the coming years. I don't know if there is information at the moment, but if the Cabinet Secretary does have any information on the timing of that consultation of the charter at this stage, we'd certainly welcome it in the Chamber today. Um, a couple of other points just to, to bring up. One, in terms of Section 3 uh, of the Bill, um, they talk about uh, the resolution of disputes by Revenue Scotland with taxpayers. And then there is the phrase, including by mediation. Now, individual cases between taxpayers and Revenue Scotland will clearly be operational matters and a decision, quite rightly, for Revenue Scotland to take. But I just wonder, by including those words, is this a, a hint from government or this, is this a, a steer from government at, that, as a policy, they would like to see uh, mediation being used by Revenue Scotland? I don't know if I've read too much into that, but again, if it is, I'd certainly uh, welcome any clarification uh, from the government. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, maybe just a last uh, thing to close, and a couple of members have talked about the block grant adjustment mechanism, and while it is not strictly uh, and directly part of the Stage 3 debate today, Obviously, the Cabinet Secretary gave evidence to the Finance Committee on Wednesday of last week about how things have moved forward. I just wonder, and perhaps the answer is no, because it was only a week ago, has anything happened in the interim period? Is there anything else that uh, the Cabinet Secretary can share with Parliament so that we can see that process uh, moving forward as fast as possible? Deputy Presiding Officer, that adjustment mechanism has to be sorted out in the coming months, but everything else underpinning this bill and indeed the other two tax bills have to be in place by the 1st of, of April next year. Uh, there is much for all of us to do in the coming months. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm. Six minutes, please, Mr Chisholm. Uh, Ian Gray began his uh, speech by quoting Einstein to the effect that the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax. Uh, to be perfectly honest, and at risk of... Uh, being expelled from the Finance Committee, I think the hardest thing in the world to understand is the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. Uh, in view of that, uh, I would like to uh, thank all those who helped me and no doubt others to understand better, namely the advisor in particular, perhaps, uh, the clerks, the witnesses, the bill team and the Cabinet Secretary himself. 
I would also like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking on board so many of the Committee's recommendations in his Stage 2 amendments and, of course, uh, further amendments today. Particularly, I should thank him uh, for uh, the amendment uh, where, uh, where he picked up the point I made in committee, uh, referring to the artifici artificiality in the GAR, I asked why the reference to reasonable business conduct in section 59 should not be extended to include personal conduct, and I welcome the amendment that uh, the Cabinet Secretary brought forward to deal with that issue. The word reasonable has haunted our discussions, and I even found myself at one point saying that the UK double reasonable test was quite reasonable, but uh, I am quite happy in the end to defer to the Government in that regard. In terms of the general anti-avoidance rule, there were some concerns that the Bill had been drawn too broadly and that the language used in defining what constitutes a reasonable action was too vague. Part 5 of the Bill outlines that any activity that has the obtaining of a tax advantage as the main purpose or one of the main purposes of the arrangement may be deemed as unlawful. I believe, however, that it is right to draw the rule quite widely, as historically and specifically in the case of HMRC, the use of a more targeted or narrow approach has led to the emergence of loopholes that can be abused by businesses. Having the principles of the GAR enshrined in the Bill will, I hope, mitigate the need for any targeted rules for tax avoidance in future. Further to this, while I recognise that the double reasonableness test may be construed as being unnecessarily complicated, its absence from this new legislation means we must make absolutely certain that channels are made available to challenge any decision in a timely and fair manner. Therefore, a vigorous approach to tax avoidance must be balanced by a fair appeals system. Uh, I raised this issue at stage one in, in the committee with the Cabinet Secretary and the committee recommended that he reconsider the restrictive rule governing appeals in the Court of Session and the number of members of the Upper Tax Tribunal for Appeals. I would welcome reassurance from the Cabinet Secretary in his wind-out about the fairness of the appeals system. Another issue of fairness concerns the contrast between the advice offered by lawyers and accountants and to what extent it should be privileged. I believe that what is and is not privileged advice should apply equally to all advisers, whether or not they are lawyers, and I would welcome a statement of the Government's uh, most up-to-date thinking on that matter. Finally, on fairness, equality between taxpayers and Revenue Scotland is also important. Part 2 of the Bill addresses the establishment of Revenue Scotland and provides for its general functions and responsibilities as we take forward the devolution process. Looking at the final draft, it is reassuring to see that a number of the recommendations made in the committee stage have been taken on board by the Cabinet Secretary with regards to this process. This includes putting taxpayers and Revenue Scotland on an even footing in terms of the expectations placed upon them in the Charter. This was not the case in previous stages of the Bill, and the change of language to standards of behaviour and values which Revenue Scotland is expected to adhere to, rather than aspire to, will not only reassure taxpayers, but also firmly cement the duties of the new body on the face of the Bill. Section 3A in paragraph 10 of the Bill should also be welcome, as it offers reassurance that the Charter will be drafted and subsequently redrafted only after Revenue Scotland consults such persons as it considers appropriate. This is good news, as the Charter should not be skewed towards the interests of Revenue Scotland, but rather represent the best practice for the widest number of stakeholders. I would, however, welcome a little more in the way of reassurance that Revenue Scotland will engage with as many stakeholders as practically possible, making it absolutely clear to Parliament who has been involved and for what reason. With regard to the delegation of powers to Registers of Scotland and SEPA of duties relating to LBT and landfill tax respectively, I welcome the pledge to publish information concerning the nature of this delegation and lay it before Parliament, and that Revenue Scotland will still be ultimately responsible for carrying out delegated functions. These powers may be delegated as and when Revenue Scotland see fit. And while I support the theory behind this, I was somewhat concerned by some of the evidence given in terms of the balance of responsibilities and pressures this may bring. The Faculty of Advocates was keen to point out that certain powers, such as the power to levy a penalty or to make an assessment, are inherently the concern of the taxing authority and that Revenue Scotland should not be given carte blanche to delegate at will. Powers must be delegated according to what works best where. 
and there are some responsibilities that are best kept within the remit of Revenue Scotland. Presiding officer, the tax system that our country adopts goes fundamentally to the heart of what sort of society we wish to create. And I believe that within the framework of devolution, it is possible to achieve the best outcomes for Scotland. In cooperating effectively, the Finance Committee and the Cabinet Secretary have provided Parliament with an effective foundation stone for fiscal devolution. The bill before us, with its enshrined charter of responsibilities, will encourage a relationship of respect between the taxpayer and the authority based on transparency and accountability. I congratulate all members who have been involved with this process and hope that in future years the same approach will be applied. I support the bill and thank the Government for bringing forward this landmark piece of legislation. Many thanks. Just before I call the Cabinet Secretary, could I remind Parliament that our debates this afternoon are on a follow-on basis and therefore I trust that all members will be in the Chamber for the next debate. Um, I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, eight minutes, please. Swinney Officer, um, Ian Gray uh, said that uh, this today marked the the conclusion of the trilogy of bills, and it, it just got me thinking. You know, there's there's Peter May, um, that great Scots author responsible for the Lewis trilogy of the Black House, the Lewis Man, and the Chessmen, and uh, there's John Swinney responsible for the trilogy of land and buildings, transaction tax, landfill tax, and the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. It's not much of a sequel to. Um, other trilogies, but um, nonetheless, very, very important legislation for the parliamentary. Put of course, argument. Ian Gray. In the uh, spirit of uh, the, the, the famous uh, scissors, paper, stone, uh, the fact, of course, is that Peter May's product will eventually end up in landfill and be subject to landfill tax. Mr. Swinney has introduced. Cabinet Secretary. Not for a long time. I, I, I do hope. Um, I think the. the the debate has been a, a, a welcome conclusion to what's been a really good parliamentary process. And I want to start by recording my thanks to the Bill team for the work that they have put in place. Uh, this is, as Mr Chisholm said, a complex area of activity. Um, if I've had to navigate the Finance Committee through this, somebody's had to navigate me through this first, and that's the Bill team, and they have been of exceptional uh, quality in supporting me in developing this legislation. Uh, in the process of doing so, as has been the case with all of the tax legislation we've taken forward over these three bills, there has been enormous consultation with external stakeholders on the contents and the provisions. Most of that we've managed to come to agreement with external stakeholders about. Some of it we just can't get to agreement about. But what I would assure Mr Chisholm about is that that approach of uh, maximum consultation and dialogue with external stakeholders will be the hallmark of how we take forward the further dialogue and discussion um, that emerges. And that extends to issues around the Charter as well, um, for which uh, I would certainly give Mr Brown the assurance that we will engage in extensive consultation, but we will also give adequate time uh, to ensure that the proper consideration can be given to these issues into the bargain. Mr Chisholm said that um, the design of the tax system is uh, very much a reflection of uh, the approach we want to take as, uh, as, as a, a country to our taxation arrangements. And the way I initiated this process by reference to the Smith principles of certainty, of convenience, of efficiency, of proportionate, uh, uh, proportionality to the ability to pay, were designed to set out how we could reflect in our modern 21st century thinking some of the great foundations of thinking which Scotland has contribut contributed to the world. And I think the modern application of these values of certainty, convenience, efficiency and proportionality to the ability to pay are important considerations for setting out what we want to achieve from our tax system and how we want our tax system to have its impact on our society. And uh, that will be the, the, the approach that we take to reflect on the, uh, uh, on the further provisions that are taken forward in the subordinate legislation, for which there will be a lot of subordinate legislation, and we will, of course, engage with Parliament around its contents. One of the other innovations of the Bill um, has been to ensure that as we take forward the, these um, great principles of Adam Smith, we design new mechanisms that are appropriate for the times. And that is how I would ca characterise 
the general anti-avoidance rule. I wanted to set out, I was very clear with Parliament at the outset, I wanted this bill to define emphatically the, the intolerance that we would have in Scotland towards uh, tax avoidance, that we wanted to err on the side of uh, tax maximisation in the way in which we stru structured our legislative framework. And um, I invited Parliament to challenge the government's thinking as to whether or not we were able to translate that lofty aspiration into practical legislative form in terms of how we took forward the, uh, the, the, the bill. And uh, we've listened carefully to the areas of uh, challenge that have come from Parliament in this respect. And I think we've responded um, significantly to that in the course of stage two and stage three as we have uh, concluded that process. Now, Presiding Officer, the, the current constitutional debate has crept into the debate. And, of course, my friend, Mr McMahon, uh, uh, didn't disappoint in, in this debate either. And, 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 and he would be disappointed in me if I didn't get onto some of this territory before I concluded my contribution to uh, this debate. Um, Mr Brown and Mr McMahon have talked about the block grant adjustment process. Um, and, of course, the block grant adjustment process is an interesting contrast to the legislative process we've gone through in the Parliament here. Across the political spectrum, with all our different opinions of how we view the world, we've all managed in this Parliament, and we will get, I assume from what I'm hearing this afternoon, to a point of unanimity about the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill when we vote later on this evening. That is because we've consider those issues in our own space, according to our own values, our own principles, and we've come to this conclusion, and I've compromised on certain things, and we've got to agreement, and Parliament will unanimously support the Bill. I think there's an interesting illustration for us there, that when we get on with these provisions, in here as members of the Scottish Parliament, working together, we can come to good, logical, sensible conclusions. And if we can do that on the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, why can't we do it on issues like welfare reform and yes. other measures on the tax system or how, our, how we should speak to the world in terms of our international policy and all of the other issues that would be able to be taken forward? Because, of course, the obstacle... And the reason why we've got to agreement... I, Mr Chisholm said that um, uh, he felt that the word reasonable had haunted the discussions of the bill. I, I consider myself to be an entirely reasonable person. I've tried my, level, yeah, exactly, tried my level best to display that reasonableness and trying to get to this position of unanimity. So if we can have that reasonableness across the chamber here in Parliament, why can't we have it on all of the issues that allow us to advance our constitutional agenda and fulfilment of our mission to deliver the very best for the people of Scotland? Because, of course, we would be able to make progress on the block grant adjustment, commission, block grant adjustment if all of my reasonableness was just absorbed by um, the other party to that discussion, which of course is Her Majesty's Treasury. And the lesson I take from all of this is when we all work together in Scotland with the legislative framework in front of us, we can take good decisions that are the hallmark of how we should be governed in the years to come. So, with those remarks, which I think are expressed entirely consistently with the, my reasonable style and with the optimistic tone of Mr Mason, uh, which was uh, uh, to the fore in the debate today, uh, I'm sure Scotland can reflect on these points in the weeks to come and come to the right uh, and sensible conclusion. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers' Bill. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. I'll allow a few moments for members to move seats. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10783 in the name of Dennis Robertson on Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill. I now invite all of those members who wish to take part in this debate to press the request to speak buttons, please. And I call on Dennis Robertson to speak to and move the motion. Ten minutes, Mr Robertson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, it's um, a great privilege for me uh, to be able to take this forward as a member's bill. And uh, in doing so, 
I'd like to begin by inviting members in the Parliament who, who believe that they might not get a, a, an opportunity to contribute during the debate to please feel free to intervene if they have a specific question uh, during uh, my opening remarks. Presiding officer, taking this forward is an empowering bill. It will empower our people with disabilities to lead full and fulfilling lives in terms of being able to exercise their right to use a blue badge which they are entitled to to find legitimate parking spaces in our towns and cities. I'm very grateful to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee for, for scrutinising the bill at stage one and at stage two. And I believe that the scrutiny that um, certainly the committee demonstrated during this process was fair, transparent and just. It actually it looked at in great depth some of the questions that many people have been asking for quite some time, presiding officer, and that is why and only why now are we looking at trying to ensure that people who have a blue badge are able to use their badge in a manner which gives them that freedom I uh, mentioned in my opening remarks. At stage two, there were uh, some amendments uh, lodged by Inclusion Scotland, and I'm grateful to, again, the committee for <coughs> scrutinising those particular amendments. I believe that we, we gave a great deal of consideration to those amendments, and I think that the conclusion was that during the consultation process that people with disabilities themselves believe that taking this bill forward in its original uh, context was the right and proper thing to do. The consultation enabled me, presiding officer, to listen to people with disabilities throughout the whole of Scotland. <clears throat> we held consultation in Aberdeen, Glasgow, here in Edinburgh, and it afforded those with uh, disabilities and organisations representing people with disabilities an opportunity to take what was being put forward and ask the, uh, uh, I think, important and appropriate questions to ensure that what we are taking forward will do what the bill intends to do. Presiding officer, in the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970 was the first time that the then orange badge came into force. And that was the first time that it was giving concession to people with a disability some uh, parking, uh, 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 sort of parking rights. And at that time, it was very clear very quickly that it was going to be open to abuse. The badge itself was open to people actually uh, coming forward with uh, counterfeit badges. The badges were being uh, openly transferred and, uh, and uh, third-party misuse was rife. And at that time, it was felt that we needed to try and tighten up the legislation. And steps have been taken throughout the years to tighten up the legislation. And now I believe we've got a badge which is robust in terms of there should be little opportunity for fraudulent uh, opportunities for the, the badge to be copied. Each badge has got a unique number, uh, presiding officer. And that unique number is, is really important because when we're actually looking at the enforcement of the badge when it's being displayed, it will enable those who are looking at it, whether it be the police, traffic warden, or other representatives from local authorities, they will be able to take that uniqueness, that unique number from the badge, and find out who this badge is, who the legitimate owner of the badge is. And if they have some degree of suspicion as to whether or not the badge is being uh, misused, they can do a check. That means if the person leaving the vehicle is, say, in their early 20s, and the badge is actually issued to someone in their, uh, say, early 80s, then they've got every right to approach the person and ask um, if that badge is legitimate or not, or if it has been misappropriated. Presenting officer, 
it's already illegal to use a badge which has been um, a... <coughs> Supposedly, well, a badge that should have been returned because maybe the person has uh, died or a badge that has been lost or stolen. So it already is a criminal offence. And that criminal offence, I think, we need to ensure that people are aware of. And it's only right and proper, I think, that people with disabilities themselves have uh, some responsibility with regard to their blue badges. During the consultation process, presiding officer, it became very clear that many people who have a blue badge were not aware and are not aware of the rules and regulations with regard to the use of their blue badge. Often, one of the biggest complaints we have is that third party misuse is okay is okay because the person using the badge is going to the shops on behalf of the person with a disability. Presiding officer, that is not the purpose of the blue badge. But if the person with a disability thinks that that is okay, then the education of the person with a disability is something we need to look at. And during the consultation process, we decided that it, to take things forward in the best interests of people with disabilities were to set up two working groups. And those working groups, uh, the uh, Police Scotland are represented, we've got local authorities represented, and people with disabilities. And what we uh, are looking at and continue to look at will be uh, top 10 tips, for instance, to make it actually clear, an easy read presiding officer for those that are being issued with the blue badge. My thanks also goes to, I think, people with disabilities themselves. Because without that consultation process and without their guidance, presiding officer, I don't think we would have been at the stage we are at today. But why do we need this? It's, we need it is because people think it's okay to park in uh, disabled parking spaces without a blue badge, for instance. They think it's okay to use a blue badge, as I've said before, as a third party misuse. It's not. It's something we shouldn't tolerate as a society. It's something that we should actually look at what is the impact of that misuse with regard to other people with disabilities. And it's not the fact that you're taking a parking space. It's you're denying a parking space to someone with a disability when you misuse that badge. And denying that person that parking space, that means that they may have to return home. They may not be able to carry out um, what they intended to go into town for, whether that be for leisure, pleasure or business. It makes no difference, presiding officer. But people need to understand that it is not just taking a parking space because it was there and available. It is denying a parking space, a space for someone with a disability that is looking for it. Just the other week, someone said to me, I, it's, I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong. But you see, I was in a hurry. I was going to be late for work. And I couldn't find a parking space. So I just parked in the blue badge space. Presiding officer, those sorts of excuses should not be acceptable to us. It's not acceptable to me. I don't think it's acceptable to this parliament. I sincerely hope that during this afternoon that we hear maybe other examples that why we need to take forward this bill. So, presiding officer, I move that Parliament agrees to pass this afternoon the Disabled Persons Parking Bill Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks, and I now call on Keith Brown. Seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, President officer, I'm very pleased to support Dennis Robertson and also to commend him for the work that he's undertaken in developing the bill, uh, and also to record my thanks to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, as well as the Finance Committee uh, and the Law Reform and Delegated Powers Committee for their consideration of the bill and the evidence from those agencies with an interest in the operation of the Blue Badge Scheme, particularly those, as Dennis Robertson has mentioned, uh, representing disability groups. 
Uh, the Bill takes a number of steps to strengthen enforcement powers for local authorities when dealing with blue badge misuse. It will allow confiscation of badges which are no longer valid or are being misused by third parties. It will make the use of a cancelled badge or one which should have been returned to the issuing authority under the blue badge regulations an offence which sits alongside the existing statutory offence for misuse of a blue badge. It will allow local authorities, should they choose, to use plain clothes officers carrying identification and authorisation to inspect and confiscate badges. And importantly, it will introduce a requirement for local authorities to have a review process in place for applicants who have been refused a blue badge. Now, on the surface of the bill, certain elements of it may appear punitive. However, its aim is to protect the rights of disabled blue badge holders and responds to calls from badge holders themselves for better enforcement of the scheme. While there have been some concerns raised primarily by Inclusion Scotland about confiscation of badges from third parties and the use of plainclothes officers, Dennis Robertson has been thorough in his consideration and consultation on this issue. And he has sought to protect badge holders by ensuring all valid badges which have been confiscated will be returned to the badge holder as soon as is practicable. In turn, local authorities also want to ensure that badge holders are able to use their badges, whether as a driver or a passenger, for the intended purpose and within the rules of the scheme. The scheme provides street parking concessions to assist badge holders to live independent lives. In response to the concerns raised by Inclusion Scotland that plainclothes officers will cause fear and alarm to badge holders or that such officers may be impersonated for fraudulent purposes, I have to agree with the conclusions reached by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee in their Stage 1 report. There are already non-uniformed council officers operating in a range of areas across Scotland without the difficulties suggested by Inclusion Scotland. And the intention behind the bill is that non-uniformed officers will improve enforcement of the Blue Badge Scheme by carrying out surveillance and gathering information and evidence on systematic abuse of blue badges. It's worth bearing in mind that the misuse or having a blue badge which is not rightfully yours can save up many thousands of pounds a year in certain parts of the country. An abuse of the scheme often involves the use of a person's badge by a friend, by a family member or carer for their own benefit. But of course it can extend beyond even that. I understand there is also a relatively lucrative trade in forged badges. The lure of free parking is a temptation that some can't refuse. The bill also extends powers to the police and traffic wardens to confiscate badges. And I'm happy to say that we are working with local authorities and Police Scotland to provide the police with access to the Blue Badge National Database, which means that they will be able to check the status of blue badges anywhere in the country. This legislation is designed to fit with existing powers and practices. And Dennis Robertson, as I suggested when he spoke just now, has not been working in isolation. He's been working very closely with two working groups with representation from local authorities, Police Scotland and third sector organisations to ensure that legislation translates and that it can easily work alongside current processes. The provisions will be supported by guidance developed by these multi-agency groups to address the requirements of the legislation. But it would also take into account the need for sensitivity and proportionality, elements of which concerns around which we had expressed at stage two. Uh, Dennis Robertson's work has been the catalyst in identifying a need to raise awareness of the Blue Badges Scheme's rules and the regulations amongst badge holders, their families, carers and indeed the wider public. And I'm pleased to see that the work is being progressed through those working groups. And the intention there is to identify ways to clarify the purpose of the Blue Badge Scheme and the impact of misuse on disabled people. And I'm sure that local authorities and the third sector will assist in getting the messages about the scheme across to the wider public. I'm also pleased to say that Transport Scotland has commissioned work to test the understanding of blue badge holders of the proposed 10 top tips for using a blue badge. These are intended to act as an aid memoir for badge holders, their relatives and carers on the do's and don'ts when using a blue badge. And that concept was supported, I think perhaps even initiated to some extent, by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Now, whilst the bill is primarily about increasing enforcement powers in practice, it will also send out a strong message to those who might think about using someone else's badge for their own gain, and hopefully it will make them think again about doing that. Uh, misuse of a badge is not only illegal, it should be socially unacceptable. 
And each time a blue badge is used for anything other than the purpose it was issued, not just one badge holder, but many are prevented from getting on with their lives because they're prohibited from accessing the parking concessions to which they're entitled. So I would thank very much uh, Dennis Robertson for the work he's done so far, and certainly the Scottish Government is very supportive of this bill. Thank you, Minister. I now call in Mark Griffin. Around five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak on the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Bill today at Stage 3 and congratulate Dennis Robertson on the progress he's made so far. I know how much hard work goes into a, a private member's bill. Uh, I know how hard Mr Robertson must have worked, even with government support, to get to this stage. Um, and I hope and I'm sure that his hard work will be paid off with the passing of the bill, since we are supportive and will be supporting the, the bill at decision time tonight. We welcome the bill's main objective to protect the rights of blue badge holders and recognise that misuse of blue badges must be tackled because it can lead to blue badge holders not being able to access a parking space when they, they need it and need it more than anyone else. A reduction in revenue for local authorities and it also and contributes to a public feeling of animosity towards badge holders when they see those blue badges being used fraudulently. We do, however, continue to seek assurances from the Scottish Government that will work with its multi-agency group to ensure that blue badge holders are properly educated on how their badges can be used so that disabled people who inadvertently misuse their badge are not penalised by the, the bill's provisions. And I welcome the, the Minister's comments around um, the advice and guidance given to genuine blue badge users. Also look to see that local government in Scotland will be properly supported and financially resourced to implement the bill's provisions, in, per in particular um, around enforcement and note that um, cause are, are relaxed on the financial impact on, of the, the review provisions, and they're, they're comfortable with those measures. Certainly. Christine Graham. I'm just curious, because I, I don't know, can local government officers enforce in things like supermarket car parks, private car parks, where there might be an abuse, or is it only in public places? Mark Griffin. My understanding is that private operators would need to come some, to some sort of agreement with local authorities or police to then enforce the, the, the provisions in a private area and that, that this only applies to, to public car parking spaces. Um, but this bill is, is designed to strengthen some of the enforcement aspects of the current legislation and to ensure that there is that statutory review in order to ensure that people who are entitled to a blue badge receive one and that people who are using one are le legitimately entitled to it. I said at stage one that this bill, this bill does fall on from Jackie Bailey's members' bill, which prevented disabled per persons parking places being occupied by those who are not entitled to them by making disabled parking bays enforceable and making sure that enforcement action could be taken against those using them without a blue badge. Um, this bill is also followed quickly by Sandra White's proposed bill on responsible parking. Um, and although she's not in the chamber, I do recall her. Um, I do recall she had some frustration that um, Dennis Robertson's bill had overtaken hers in the parliamentary process. But I'm sure she'll have been in touch with the Minister for Parliamentary Business on that one. But Sandra White's bill aims to allow freedom of movement for all pedestrians by restricting parking at drop curbs on pavements and double parking, and that affects disabled people as they may find it difficult to negotiate wheelchairs on pavements or across roads if the way is blocked by a parked car. And to me, these three pieces of legislation um, complement each other uh, well and combined um, will go a long way towards making our towns and cities much more accessible to people who have a, a disability. The, the proposed powers in the bill will be a welcome addition to a local authority in tackling blue badge misuse and the impact it has on, on genuine users, as long as they are supported financially to enforce those powers. In particular, the power to cancel a badge gives local authorities 
the, the power to cancel that badge that is no longer held by the, the person that is issued to, to to combat the issue of badges um, being, being passed on to, to other people. As the Minister did say, it seems to be quite a lucrative trade um, and the savings that someone could make parking in, say, Glasgow City Centre do run into the, the thousands of pounds and that, that power um, will be welcomed by local authorities. Um, Presiding officer, like I said at the outset, we do support um, the bill. We'll be supporting tonight at the vote and look forward to the bill becoming an act and improving the lives of genuine blue badge holders across Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Cameron Buchanan around five minutes, please, Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I should start by redeclaring an interest as a blue badge holder and as a badge holder, as well as a fellow MSP, sorry, as well as a fellow MSP, that I would like to reiterate my congratulations to Dennis Robertson for bringing this legislation forward and express my wholehearted support. In response to Christine Graham's question about supermarkets, the parking enforcement cannot be enforced there because it's private ground. But it is the hope that the word shame will come into it and that eventually the public will realise that this is just not acceptable. But there's nothing we can do about it in private parking spaces, I'm afraid, at the moment. In the earlier stages, I outlined why I supported the legislation, bringing, as it does, a much-needed improvement in the administration and enforcement of the Blue Badge Scheme, as well as wider recognition of its importance. It is crucial that any update to the scheme brings tangible benefits to the Blue Badge holders, without, which part, without placing undue burdens or legal concerns upon them. I believe that this bill actually does strike that balance. I strongly support the need to highlight the reliance of Blue Badge users on the scheme in order to freely carry out everyday tasks, as well as the need to close the gap in perception between those who believe occasional misuse is acceptable and the legitimate users who so greatly depend on its benefits being available. I did, however, highlight previously a number of finer points that were yet to be adequately discussed in its early stages including the issues of non-uniform police officers or non-uniform officers, penalties and the powers of confiscation. Some amendments were suggested and the powers were, were withdrawn. So, sorry, some amendments suggested that, though, though withdrawn, led to constructive discussion. And I'm pleased to say that I continue to support the bill in its entirety. We should note that there were a range of views expressed over the issues of non-uniform police officers. I was also lobbied by Inclusion Scotland, as were others, and they expressed the view that enforcement officers should be uniformed, and that, but the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, we reached agreement that the Bill's provisions for non-uniformed officer, enforcement officers would benefit the scheme and could be implemented smoothly. The main issue here is passing a Bill that strikes the balance between the most effective way of enforcing the legislation and showing an appropriate, which is very important, this appropriate level of sensitivity to blue badge users and their personal circumstances. We rightly centred on how officers would be identified to users and how assurances could be given the likes of Inclusion Scotland. This was re this, the committee was reassured that all officers would carry ID cards. I'm pleased to say that I believe the bill as it stands strikes this balance. And this leads us to a similar point with penalties. The Law Society of Scotland highlighted its concerns over the inclusion of criminal strict liability offence for using a badge once cancelled, using the sledgehammer and walnut analogy. However, the committee also considered the views of Police Scotland, who raised strong points in favour of the Bill's existing penalty provisions. Again, our task was to ensure that the Bill struck an ideal balance between delivering improvements to the scheme and protecting its users, and the views of, fortunately, the views of Police Scotland prevailed. On this note, it was raised that, that penalties after unintentional misuse could hurt vulnerable users. Although an amendment motivated by these concerns was suggested, we were reassured that a person could only be found guilty of an offence if a level of knowledge or intent could be proven. Despite this, it is apparent the enforcement of this legislation will require local authority officers and police, where appropriate, to exercise their duties with a good deal of care and, indeed, sensitivity. Whilst we are agreed that in clear-cut cases of fraud we expect the perpetrator to be prosecuted, I think we would all expect discretion to be shown in the more complex cases that will undoubtedly arise. I believe that the Bill allows this flexibility, as well as minimising incidents of innocent misuse through clearer communication to blue badge holders. This 10-point uh, card that we're proposing, I think, will 
answer that question because the problem we had before was the instructions were too complicated. And everybody who got the instructions just flung them in a drawer, myself included. For, some, for similar reasons, it is important that we consider carefully the implications of any new powers granted to the enforcement officers. With this in mind, we had a necessary discussion on the extension of powers to confiscate badges. Although a fellow committee member lodged an amendment aiming to limit the proposed powers to non-valid badges only and not for third-party use, it was agreed that the existing powers would substantially benefit genuine users because abuse would be discouraged and therefore parking spaces would be freed up. Furthermore, reassurances were given that badges would only be confiscated for very justifiable reasons and valid badges would be returned within 14 days maximum. And this too is important. In previous debates, I touched on the issue of funding, which is of course necessary to consider. I believe though that the bill as it stands is proportionate in its resource requirements and will be manageable to enforce. The sensible decision against establishing an external decision review process is an example of this. Accordingly, presiding officer, I am pleased to note that the implications of this bill have been extensively discussed and properly considered. As, as I highlighted before, the main consideration through, throughout has been to ensure that the ideal balance is struck between delivering improvements to the scheme and protecting its users. It is my belief that this bill achieves this balance and will be re bring real benefits to the genuine users of the Blue Badge scheme, including myself. As a result, I am delighted to support it. Thank you. Many thanks. Before I move on to the open debate, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to 5.50pm. And I invite Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion, please. Formally moved. Many thanks. The question is then that we bring decision time forward to 5.50pm. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now turn to the open debate. And I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Speeches of four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me, uh, like others, congratulate Dennis Robertson on bringing forward this bill, which I'm sure is going to be successful uh, at 17.50 hours. It is, of course, as a bill, uh, a return, perhaps, to the way in which the old Scots Parliament legislated. The 1491 uh, Common Good Act was a mere four lines long. And uh, Dennis Robertson's bill has the clarity and conception, the purity and purpose and the economy of expression that we saw in bills such as the common good contained in a mere four lines. And of course, the private uh, member's bill process in this parliament lends itself to these tightly focused, clearly expressed and articulated pieces of legislation. Um, I, I think others might usefully learn from that process, which is open to all, even if Sandra White uh, may be one of those who is uh, disappointed. Now, the whole core of this to, is to improve life for people with some disability that requires them to have help with parking. And I think we need to think in terms of the dignity of the people who have a disability. Um, my own experience uh, in the early 70s when a couple of uh, colleagues who were blind for the very first time were able to receive their bank statements in Braille, up to that point, other people had to read their bank statements to them. That was a loss of dignity because their confidential information had perforce to be shared with others. By the same token, when we ensure that there is adequate parking at the end of what may be an essential journey or a leisure journey, it's not for us to decide, but there is actually a parking place for someone who needs it, we confer upon that person the dignity we are all entitled to expect. So I think this bill is excellent in ensuring that we share the dignity we are all entitled to more widely. Now, there's been a little bit of uh, discussion about the powers of the enforcement officers in the matter of uniform. Now, in 1968, uh, my summer job as a student was as a water bailiff. Uh, I had a warrant card. I could arrest people. I had the untrammeled right of entry into any premises without cause shown, and I had no uniform. And that had been the case for a very, very long time. Uh, now, the difference, of course, is not 
to make the point, which I do, that you can have powers without uniform and they can be justly provided, but that people were used to the idea that what had been in their uniforms. When we have enforcement offices, it will be new, and we need to have some tact and diplomacy in the early days in which uh, it operates. Inclusion in Scotland, quite properly, uh, have, of course, uh, focused on the potential there is for these officers and for traffic wardens and policemen uh, in relation to the confiscation of badges, where that confiscation turns out uh, not to have been necessary or, or appropriate. And I think they have a valid point. And that's why, in the introduction of an enforcement regime, which is going to contribute enormously to uh, people with disabilities, we need to be careful uh, how we do it. Now, people who have disabilities are not necessarily uh, people who see themselves as other parts of society. My mother was four foot ten and a half. She walked on elbow crutches for most of her uh, adult life. But when she got behind the wheel of the Mini Cooper S that she drove, I remember being with her, and this is before Barbara Castle introduced the universal speed limit, doing 100 miles an hour down the Bagley Strait. Transport sometimes can be transformative. It was for my mother. Let's make sure in providing parking at the end of the journey, don't travel at 100 miles an hour. It diminishes the chance of getting there, um, that we will enhance the lives of certain people and give them the dignity that they deserve. Presiding officer. Many thanks. And I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, President Officer. And as a member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, I have had ample opportunity to consider in detail the proposals contained within this Bill and the subsequent amendments to it. I would once again like to thank Dennis Robertson, MSP, for bringing this important issue to the attention of the Scottish Parliament. And I commend his efforts in raising awareness of the damaging consequences of the misuse of our Blue Badge scheme. I would like to reiterate that I support this Member's Bill and acknowledge that it is likely to deliver a reduction in disabled parking badge fraud. I am hopeful that this will lead to an increase in the number of parking spaces that are available to genuine disabled people and will, as a consequence, increase the quality of life for those who suffer mobility issues. Presiding officer, I know that the scale of the problem that local authorities are facing in distinguishing between genuine and fraudulent badge holders is significant. From the evidence gathered within the Local Government Committee through the progress of this bill, I have also learned that nearly 80% of the blue badge holders have direct, directly experienced abuse of the system. This bill has the potential to substantially reduce the inconvenience caused for disabled drivers. My support for this bill arises from the conviction that those who are entitled to a blue badge should be able to access disabled parking bays when they need to. The availability of these accessible spaces should never be compromised by the self-interest of those who use blue badges for convenience alone. I feel strongly that the Scottish Government should seek to work with key stakeholders, including local authorities themselves, to ensure that the implementation of this bill is consistent across the country and does not cause unnecessary confusion amongst genuine badge holders. I continue to believe that badge holders should be provided with comprehensive and accessible information on how their badges can be used. This would provide reassurance that disabled people who inadvertently misuse their badge are not penalised by the provisions of the Bill. I recognise concerns raised by Inclusion Scotland that disabled persons or a carer may be criminalised where they have inadvertently used a badge that has been cancelled. For example, if a badge has been reported lost but was subsequently found before the replacement has been issued. I am therefore grateful for recent assurances that no action would be taken against an individual in these circumstances. I am confident that this common sense approach will be maintained after the implementation of the bill, and I anticipate that genuine badge holders will benefit from the policy. 
I do believe that local authorities should be fully resourced to implement the provisions of the Bill, including both the enforcement and review elements of the Blue Badge application process. I would, however, um, be concerned if local authorities were tasked to implement these new assessments and enforcement provisions without the appropriate level of funding to allow council officers to carry out their duties effectively. Notwithstanding this concern, I am delighted to confirm my support for this proposed legislation and I look forward to my disabled constituents receiving the benefit of an increased number of accessible parking spaces across the city. Again, presiding officer, I would like to thank Dennis Robertson, MSP, and the Scottish Government civil servants for all their hard work at every stage behind bringing this bill to this stage in the chamber today. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Jim Hume to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to participate in this, the final stage of this bill. And of course, I'd like to also begin by congratulating Dennis, Dennis Robertson on all his good work bringing this bill this far. And of course, look forward to it being passed later today. The Blue Badge Scheme is an extremely important tool to enable the independence and lifestyles of those with mobility issues who would otherwise face unacceptable difficulties in maintaining regular day-to-day -day activities. It must be pre preserved and protected from those who would abuse the scheme. Each time a blue badge is misused on a car parked in an area where only those with valid blue badges are allowed to park denies genuine blue badge users from using that space. I know that this is a particularly pro problematic in city centres where parking charges can be quite prohib prohibitive and this has led to people abusing blue badges by trying to park on the cheap. According to an officer from the City of Edinburgh Council, and a quote, between 52 and 70 per cent of all badges that are on display in Edinburgh will be misused. That's a staggering figure, though I understand that there are some, including Scotland, for example, who have reservations over the veracity of that claim. Nonetheless, there are badges being abused and it must be tackled. During stage two deliber deliberations, I know that John Wilson lodged a number of amendments on behalf of Inclusion Scotland due to some concerns they shared over the bill. I had some sympathy with his amendment number one, which sought to limit the powers of confiscation to only non-valid badges. I too worry about eligible badge holders having their badge confiscated due to the actions of a third party and are then left to face the consequences. I accept the point that having this power is important to dissuade such acts in order to free up spaces for those who genuinely need them, but I do not want those who desperately need the badge to go without it for any length of time. However, I am satisfied with the reassurances that was delivered to the committee that valid badges would be returned to holders within 14 days of confiscation, with an explanatory letter reminding the holder of their responsibilities. I believe that that uh, strikes a proportionate response. So uh, I do expect the Scottish Government to monitor whether holders are routinely receiving their badges back within two weeks as promised. With the creation of a new strict liability offence, it's important that all badge holders are aware of their responsibilities to ensure no inadvertent misuse. It's certainly the case that the current booklet distributed to holders is a bit clunky and I welcome the evidence provided to committee by Scottish Government officials which acknowledge this and the work they are doing with officials to produce a more appropriate document. I also welcome the good progress being made by the Blue Badges Enforcement Working Group to develop a code of practice guidance which, among its key tasks, will be to ensure that enforcement officers should always deal with people in a sensitive manner. I think it's extremely important that disability equality awareness should be a focal point of any guidance for officers and we should ensure it is uppermost in their minds when on duty. This bill aims to strengthen the existing framework and safeguard the rights of disabled people. I think Dennis Robertson, who must be congratulated, was right to introduce it to this parliament and I do look forward to supporting it later this afternoon. Thank you very much. And I now call Kevin Stewart. And after Kevin Stewart, we will turn to the closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too uh, pay tribute to Dennis Robertson 
uh, for bringing this uh, bill to Parliament, and I hope uh, that it will gain unanimous support today. I, I realise, as many other colleagues do, uh, that sometimes it's not easy uh, st uh, steering a member's bill uh, through this place. Um, and I think as well as paying tribute to Mr Robertson, uh, I think we should also acknowledge the work that his staff have done uh, in bringing uh, this bill uh, to this stage too. Um, I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues in the Local Government Committee uh, for being as assiduous and collegiate as they normally are. Um, I would like to thank all of those folks who gave all evidence and took part in the consultations, uh, the written ones and the, the events that took place in Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow. And beyond that, uh, I think that we should recognise the efforts of the Transport Scotland officials who have been working on this. Because what we have seen from them uh, is a huge amount of common sense and gumption to try and get us to a, pl a place where this is entirely workable. Now, Mr Robertson's draft proposal for the bill was to strengthen the blue badge scheme enforcement powers, including powers to cancel and confiscate badges in certain circumstances and to provide an appeals pr process for applicants when their blue badge application is refused on eligibility grounds. Now, I recognise that many members uh, in this place, um, particularly those who have previously uh, served on local authorities, know how difficult it is sometimes uh, to deal uh, with blue badge issues. And I think that this bill uh, will strengthen our hand and ensure um, a much, much fairer system. Uh, and that recognition uh, of uh, the, the common sense of Mr Robertson's proposals led to uh, 41 MSPs supporting the draft proposal, or the final proposal, sorry, for the bill, 33 SNP, 7 Labour uh, and Jean Ucker MSP. Uh, and I hope that other members who uh, uh, either couldn't or chose not to sign uh, that final proposal will unite today behind a bill which I think has been pretty well scrutinised uh, and has led, uh, I think, uh, to some good options uh, being put forward. Um, I talked about the common sense uh, of this entire debate, the scrutiny uh, of the proposal. Uh, and, you know, as we have gone through, we have seen uh, a number of additions. Two working groups was mentioned uh, by the Minister, which uh, continue uh, to, to do uh, good work. And I am quite sure uh, that we will continue uh, to look at the effects uh, of the bill uh, after it has been passed. Um, misuse of badges has always been a problem. And sometimes, uh, you know, as Dennis uh, rightly pointed out in his speech, um, yet some people uh, feel uh, that there are certain things which they do with blue badges, which is kind of all right. Mr Robertson mentioned somebody being a bit late for work. Um, we heard of an example in Aberdeen of a home help using a blue badge so she could get nearer uh, to her client's door. Now, these things are wrong. Uh, and we must get that right uh, in future. We heard from Edinburgh City Council that between 52% and 70% of all badges that are on display are being used, misused. These are horrifying uh, figures, presiding officer, and we must recognise that for every single abuse that goes on, we may be taking away somebody else's independence, and that is wrong. I pay tribute to Dennis Robertson uh, for bringing this proposal through uh, and I do hope that everybody will unite behind this uh, decision time tonight. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Cameron McCannon, a generous four minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was going to say there are still, however, many anomalies with blue badge parking and whether holders have to pay parking fees or can park to unload on single or double lines. So there are still a few issues that we need to uh, appreciate. Also, when I was in Westminster and in London recently, I found that we had to actually pay for all parking, whether, and it wasn't really very clearly written up, so we need to, we had to pay for the parking 
even in a blue badge area. So if it, and it wasn't clearly written, therefore I actually got a parking fine. Now, having travelled the continent very, very, you know, very surprisingly, one of the countries with the harshest penalties is Italy. And as such, the dis dis disabled parking spaces are rarely abused because they have very harsh penalties. One wouldn't normally think that. I don't really think there's much more I can add, having had the history lesson from Stuart Stevenson, the eloquence of Anne McTaggart, the reason was, as usual, from Jim Hume, the congratulatory messages from Kevin Stewart, and we all agree, and I really don't think there's any more I need to say. I'm very supportive of the bill, as you would gather, so thank you very much. Many thanks. And now Colin Mark Griffin, an even more generous four minutes, Mr Griffin. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. It has been a, a relatively short debate and certainly a short speech there um, from, from Cameron Buchanan. Um, I'll not quite be so, so short on this one. It was a consensual debate, which I think was, as, as reflects on the general support from witnesses, local government and regeneration committee, and the fact that we've had no amendments this afternoon to, to consider. All of that, I think, is testament to the hard work carried out by Dennis Robertson with the steering groups which were set up and the work done with local authority, police and transport Scotland. In my opening remarks, I outlined why we support the bill, eh, which will bring much needed improvement to the administration of the, the blue badge scheme. Um, it was pointed out in a contribution by the, the minister at the in the stage one debate that a particularly determined individual could save themselves around £6,000 a year in parking charges by fraudulently using a, a blue badge in one of our city centres. Now, the, in itself, that is a, a shocking misuse, but when you consider the fact that that parking space is now no longer available to a genuine badge holder, then it, it just compounds matters. We have been concerned about the financial impact on local authorities and have been reassured that they can cope with additional costs of review, but still have some question about the ability of authorities to meaningfully resource the enforcement aspect. Now, regardless of that question, um, hopefully it should result in increased revenue to councils as misuse of the, the blue badge is reduced from the current level. I also mentioned that in my open contribution that there is a great deal of synergy with this bill and other legislation that has been enacted and bills in the pipeline, Jackie Bailey's bill on disabled person parking places and Sandra White's bill on responsible parking, as I said earlier. I think those three combine well um, to improve the, the situation for, for disabled people and, and really combine will go a long way towards making our towns and cities much more accessible to people who, who have a disability. Section 1 in the bill sets out how the badge will be improved. That should address the issue with people tampering with an expired badge to extend the expiry date or by changing the photo. Um, some of the evidence given indicates that the tampering and misuse of badges in this way can be fairly lucrative with the free parking on offer in many areas. Where, is, where it is expensive to park without the badge. Section 1 should then reduce the costs to local authorities through that lost revenue and open up those spaces to genuine badge holders. The proposed powers in the bill will, will be a welcome addition to a local authority in tackling blue badge misuse and the impact it has on genuine users, as long as they are supported financially to enforce those powers. Um, while we always been supportive of that legislation. Again, we did seek that assurance that there would be an education campaign for those genuinely um, using their, their blue badge of exactly what they can and, and can't do. And again, welcome the Minister's comments around the guidance that will be issued to try and um, resolve some of those, some of those issues. President officer, we do support the bill. We'll be supporting it at the vote tonight and look forward to the bill becoming an act and improving the lives of genuine blue badgers, blue badge holders across Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call the Minister Keith Brown uh, to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Uh, Minister, you have a very generous six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, 
Can I thank uh, members for a, an informed and interesting debate? Of course, there has been a degree of consensus. I would say that's not entirely by um, accident. I think the work that's been done by De Dennis Robertson in the earlier stages of the bill, both within the Parliament and also with the interest parties who have been involved in this, has actually led to some of the earlier concerns, indeed some of the amendments which were proposed uh, actually being dealt with very effectively. So I think a lot of the credit does go to Dennis Robertson for that. And once again, I'd commend him for his work in taking forward uh, the Disabled Persons Parking Badges uh, Scotland Bill. I would also like to reiterate my thanks for the two multi-agency working groups for their work in support of the Bill, and also the points made by um, Kevin Stewart in relation to the work done by both Dennis Robertson's own staff and also by the work of the officials in Transport Scotland, who I think have been very effective in providing support uh, through this process. Uh, the Bill should not Certainly I will. Um, the, the ministers again mentioned the two working groups who are looking at various aspects. But in terms of the guidance itself, which will, will go out, uh, will Parliament have an opportunity at some point to have a look at that and also to help improve that? Um, because I, I think one of the best things about this entire process has been the level of input from various folks and, as I said earlier, the fact that common sense has been applied at every stage. Thank you, Minister Keith Brown. I would be happy to give the undertaking that we will look into how best we can involve Parliament in that process, given not least, as I mentioned already, that it was the uh, Local Government Committee that made uh, that suggestion um, in order to try and simplify the advice. So we will look into how we can best consult with the Committee and others in order to do that. I think, though, it is also true to say the Bill should not be seen in isolation. It complements uh, a number of reforms of the scheme over recent years, and those have been aimed at providing a parking concession which enables disabled people, who could not otherwise do so, to have access to the day-to-day -day things which most people take for granted, such as health care, work and social activities. And that intention continues in the way the Scottish Government has been tackling the impact of the UK Government's welfare reform programme. And if I could give some context to that, because uh, it's not been raised to a huge extent so far, but it does provide uh, the context for these changes which are now being proposed. And it's also, uh, because of the time we have available, a chance to look further into that. It's quite clear in our view that the uh, changes which the UK Government have made to the welfare system, including the change, crucially, from disability living allowance to personal independence payments, are causing significant anxiety and distress to people in Scotland. I think... I have had from all corners of the Chamber people writing to me about individual cases to do with blue badges over recent months. And it is completely unacceptable in our view that some of the most vulnerable people in society are not getting the support they need in that relation. However, our work has gone far beyond the steps taken to protect blue badge holders in England and Wales. Uh, of course, we believe the best solution is for the Scottish Parliament to have control uh, over these uh, welfare matters. Uh, last year, in establishing arrangements to allow those who receive personal independence payments to passport automatically to the scheme, we recognised the potential impact of the decision to tighten the threshold in order to receive the highest rate of PIP. And that is why the passporting arrangements from PIP extends to those who receive the standard rate at eight points or more for the moving around activity. And that, ensured, that measure taken by the Scottish Government ensured that the passporting arrangements from PIP and disability living allowance were as equivalent as possible. And obviously we continue to monitor further changes uh, proposed in this area. We have also taken further action in, to mitigate against the potential effects of PIP by including two further eligibility criteria covering those people who passported under DLA but who do not receive PIP at a rate to passport following reassessment for the new welfare benefit. I will do. Kevin Stewart. Um, uh, like the Minister, I would like to see uh, the demise of personal independence payments, which are uh, really frightening some folk out there. Uh, and I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has uh, made moves in terms of the passport benefits to ensure that as many folk as possible uh, still qualify. One of the things uh, which uh, I come across quite a lot, Minister, and I'm sure others do too, um, is the fact that information is not getting out there about these things. I wonder if you could commit to, to contacting uh, some of the uh, charities out there about what the Scottish Government has done. 
Uh, I'm more than happy to look uh, further into that. We have done a great deal of work because we knew how important this was. And just to put it in plain terms, some people who had understood they had eligibility for blue badge schemes and to passport into that automatically, of course, have been affected by these decisions. And they're asking why it's the case, for example, they're having to be reassessed. So if there's anything further we can do to make sure that message is spread out, then we'll, we'll certainly do that. Um, we continue to monitor uh, the actions which have been taken by the UK Government in this rate and also uh, the first new criteria applies to those who do not receive PIP at passporting rate and we are challenging that decision with the DWP. Uh, the second new criteria ensures that those who are in receipt of a lifetime or indefinite higher rate DLA award will continue to retain passporting entitlement to a blue badge irrespective of the outcome of the PIP application. In addition, we have also mitigated against the well-reported delays to the PIP assessment process by ensuring that those who have applied for PIP but have not received their PIP decision at the time their higher rate DLA ends will continue to passport to the Blue Badge Scheme. Uh, we made it clear through the White Paper that if elected, of course, the first uh, Government of Independent Scotland would halt the further rollout of PIP. And that would allow the first Government to design a welfare system to meet uh, the people of Scotland's needs, and especially in this case, the people uh, requiring to access Blue Badge Scheme uh, to meet their needs as well. We want the right people to have uh, the badge. We also want a scheme that is fit for purpose. And I think uh, to go back to Dennis Robertson's um, uh, introductory speech, without the strengthened enforcement powers which this bill provides, it will be the case that some disabled badge holders may not reap the benefits to which they are entitled. And that is the real point here, to make sure that those that need it are the ones that get this. I am sure, just to go back to the point raised by Christine Graham, uh, who I think is no longer here, but she raised the point about supermarkets. And as Mark Griffin rightly says, uh, the government has no control over that. These are private spaces. However, I did write to the supermarkets some months ago to ask them to look into this and to see what further they could do to protect the rights of people with disabilities. I think we've all had the experience of going to a supermarket, seeing the disabled uh, bays completely full, and see somebody with a disability having to struggle uh, further afield than they should do, when it was perfectly clear that some people using those bays didn't require them. Uh, so what I would undertake to do is, uh, if, as I expect this bill passes, to, to write again to the supermarkets, again to draw their attention to what we've done here, and seeing if there's any way that we can strengthen that. Uh, but my last point on this, uh, President Officer, would be once again to thank uh, Dennis Robertson for the work that he's done, the way he's brought people together, the way he's managed to deal with some of the concerns which have been evident throughout this process, uh, and also to commend him. If, as long as it's not an application to be a non-uniformed officer, I'm happy to take the intervention. <laughs> Anything's possible with Mr Stevenson? Mr Stevenson. Um, I, I just wondered uh, if the Minister might uh, be able to inform us a little bit about the enforcement process of validating badges. We heard in the debate, for example, uh, that the enforcement officer would recognise that a badge was for somebody who was 75, whereas the person in the vehicle was 40. And I just wondered, in designing the badge and the enforcement system, how we are going to reconcile the need for privacy for the badge holder, and we're not putting photographs on them for that reason, I understand, uh, with the need for accurate information. And I, I say that in the context of my own driver's license and everyone else's has a coded six-digit number that gives my birth date but the encoding is, and, and gender. But the encoding is so crude that it can be broken in three and a half seconds. And I just wonder how the government is going to take that issue forward in uh, taking the bill into uh, practice, uh, protecting the, the rights of people to privacy, while ensuring that we have a clear and unambiguous way that those who are enforcing the use of badges uh, can do so in an appropriate way. Minister? Uh, well, I wouldn't want to steal uh, Dennis Robertson's thunder, and maybe he'd want to come back on some of those points, but some of these uh, challenges have been dealt with in the earlier reforms, the, the most recent reforms to the Blue Badge Scheme, where both the, the database and the badge itself have been upgraded in terms of security, and I've mentioned already we're in discussions with Police Scotland to allow them to access that database, so that should be the means by which we make sure that we get it right, that those that are challenging people are aware if it's plainly not that person's badge. Um, and, of course, a unique identifier, which Dennis Robertson uh, mentioned, will, will help in that regard. But maybe Dennis Robertson, in his concluding remarks, would want to say more about that. But I'm convinced that with the uh, changes which we've, made, made, which we've made previously, and which the ones which uh, Dennis Robertson had proposed, we've bolstered a very secure uh, system, which should, at the bottom line, ensure that those 
that uh, want to use, need to use, uh, not just disabled parking spaces, because of course the blue badge gives you a wider discretion to park elsewhere uh, than just disabled parking spaces. If the Minister only could start those, winding up. But by those that uh, are legitimately using it and try to eradicate the practice of those that are not entitled to, to, to park there from doing so. And I think if you do that, it would be a real achievement of this bill from Dennis Robertson. Thank you. I now call on Dennis Robertson to wind up the debate. Mr Robertson, you have eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, in uh, winding up this debate, uh, can I first of all uh, extend my sincere thanks uh, to those who managed to intervene uh, during this uh, short debate, but uh, a very important debate. It also affords me the opportunity, Presiding Officer, to extend my genuine thanks. My genuine thanks to the Minister for supporting me through this process. The team from Transport Scotland, who, uh, with, without their guidance, uh, I think I would have found it virtually impossible to take this bill forward. Um, they, they've been absolutely fantastic at, at guiding me through uh, the, the, the process. And, of course, as Kevin Stewart rightly said, uh, my own staff, uh, uh, which, again, they have been extremely supportive. The the extent of my thanks also, again, uh, can I say, presiding officer, goes to the Local Government and Regener Regeneration Committee for their scrutiny during stage one and two. And, and, you know, Stuart Stevenson was appointed at stage two to uh, enable the process to meet the requirements of Parliament. And can I extend my sincere thanks to Stuart uh, for assisting me in that process at stage two. Presiding officer, it's a small bill, uh, I think we've said this before, but it's a small bill, I think, with a significant impact for people with disabilities. Um, with the powers that we're looking to, to uh, provide to local authorities, it is about enforcement. And it has already been said that any enforcement that is taken forward would be done sensitively. Sensitively and in a manner which will not cause anxiety to badge holders themselves. The point that Stuart Stevenson was uh, mentioned uh, to the Minister in his intervention, and the Minister, I, I thank for actually addressing uh, most of those points. But in terms of the photographic identification, uh, all blue badges uh, will continue to have a photograph, but it's at the request of people with disabilities themselves that the badge that it remains face down and it's the unique number identification number on each badge which will actually ensure that the badge holder will be identified through any enforcement process there is no intention presiding officer to take a sledgehammer as Cameron uh, Buchanan suggested to crack the nut um, because there will be no need to because we will have the information on the database. It's, we will not uh, go to every blue badge and investigate, because there's no reason to. What we're trying to do through this process, presiding officer, is to establish a pattern of misuse, a pattern which can be evident. And I think Gordon Cashley in Edinburgh uh, does that. And when he gave the evidence to the... Uh, local government committee at stage one. He explained uh, how he goes about uh, his function. And it's that, at that point when we're able to determine whether a badge is being misused or not. But one of the things that this bill does, presiding officer, is a review process. We're bringing forward a process which hasn't been afforded to a person with a disability um, since the new criteria came about. And that is that right of a review. A review if their application is turned down. A review which will be looked at and the criteria again examined to ensure that if the person does genuinely require a blue badge, they will indeed be afforded that blue badge. Presiding officer, there was only 20 local authorities with a review process when we started at stage one in the process of bringing this bill forward. I can now confirm that 
32 local authorities. Every single local authority has now put in place a review process. Now, that in itself is progress, presiding officer, and I think that is to be commended to local authorities. We have come a long way, I think, in this journey, presiding officer, but we've still got a long way to go. Will the introduction of this bill stop universal misuse? I believe not. Will it prick the conscience of those determined to misuse the badge? I believe not. But it would, it would, what it has done and will do, presiding officer, well, it will raise the awareness. It will raise the awareness not just through the media, but it will raise the awareness of those badge holders themselves. And as Cameron Buchanan said, one of the, trying to ensure that the guidelines that we give people when we're uh, issuing a blue badge is really important. Cameron, through, Cameron McKenna, through his own admission, said when he got the regulations, he took one look at it and put them in the drawer. I sincerely hope that through common sense and use of his blue badge has ensured that he hasn't had a parking ticket, uh, apart from the time in London. But, uh, presiding officer, it's not just about blue badge spaces themselves. It's about using the, uh, the blue badge to ensure that if there is a single yellow line, a double yellow line, that you can park appropriately, providing there's no other restrictions. When it comes to the uh, issue of private car parking, as the uh, intervention from Christine Graham initially came forward, I'll give an undertaking to Parliament uh, as the Minister did uh, initially, I also wrote to the supermarkets and retail outlets to look at what they have uh, already done to monitor the, the use of blue badge spaces. I will give an undertaking to Parliament today, Presiding Officer, to once again write to the supermarket chains, write to the retail outlets, to find a way on the back of this bill, if it is passed this afternoon, which I sincerely hope it will be, um, to ask them to probably step up to the plate and look at ways that they can actually find to enforce the use of the blue badge spaces within those private areas. And again, it's also important to ensure that our health boards actually step up to the plate too. They have already the means to uh, 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 monitor and to ensure that blue badge spaces are appropriately used. One minute. And I'll be asking the health boards to ensure that again on the back of this bill that they also look at ways that they can enforce the use of their uh, disabled parking spaces. Presiding officer, it's been an enjoyable process. It's been a lengthy process. But my thanks does go to all those who participated during the consultation. All those people that want to see a bill that will give them better uh, use of their blue badge. A bill that will surely, hopefully, prick the conscience of those people who have misused badges. It will also give us the guidelines that we so desperately need to try and ensure that a person with a disability can use the badge appropriately without confusion. Presiding officer, I thank the Parliament today through stage one and stage two but for this afternoon's very short debate, but concise debate, and every person that participated, and for offering their sincere, um, I think, assurances that they will be supporting this bill through the last process this afternoon. Presiding officer, thank you. Thank you, Mr Robertson. That concludes the debate on the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill. We now move to decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 10822, in the name of John Swinney, on the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Bill is passed. The next question is at motion number 10783, in the name of Dennis Robertson, on the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill is passed.
That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members should leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.